Welcome back to Gold Derby. I'm Christopher Rosen. I'm joined by Joy Singh. And Joyce, we're back to talk about next year's Oscars already. It's never too soon. Boy, am I psyched. I've been thrilled about it. I've been thinking about this for weeks. You have. I've I've only seriously started doing this on Monday. And it's been a, a rough 48 hours. <laughs> it's not easy. It's going to be a fun year. Uh, I could already tell. Uh, just to, So we're going to, first thing we're going to do is recap what we did at this time last year for our 2024 Oscar picks. Last year was a lot easier. It was a lot easier. We did quite well, Joyce. I just have to say, high five to us. I'm going to gloat like I'm David L. Or Evo. With no questions. Just no. gloating about your picks. Uh, so yeah, first we're going to recap our picks from this last year. Then we're going to do this year. And then we'll do emails later all about uh, the recapping the Oscars one last time before we say goodbye to awards the Oscars for a few months and switch into Emmys. Can't wait. Look, look at all this green in, in our Google Doc. I, I have a Google Doc that I did, Joyce, and I, I greened, I, I highlighted in green all the ones we got right. And boy, what a great job. Just, we're so good. That's a big top, top line take. We're so away. good because it was very easy last year. Okay. So best picture last year in March, just to show where we were. My picks were Barbie, Blitz, The Color Purple, Dumb Money, Dune Part 2, Kills the Flower Moon, Maestro, Oppenheimer, Past Lives, and Poor Things. So I got six out of 10 and two of them moved to 2025 and I'm going to put them in this year again. So that's great. Uh, and you had the same, you had five out of 10. You had the holdovers, which I did not have. Um, but I you was also an had, early adopter of the holdovers. You, were. you also had Blitz and Dune part two. You and I both had the color purple. And then you had La Camara, which is actually was technically eligible for 2024 Oscars, but, but like, nothing happened. And it's coming out now. It's like out this week, <laughs> I think. Uh, and Saltburn, you had an early adopter on Saltburn, Joyce, which would become my favorite, uh, one of my faves of the year. Who would have guessed it would have become your favorite? No. Uh, no, no one who listens to this. <laughs> so six out of 10 and five out of 10, immediately off the bat. I, if we do that well this year, I would be shocked, <laughs> frankly. Just... We did a lot better in August when... We could just read quickly to recap in August. I had a, a seven out of 10 because I still had Color Purple and Dune and I had Saltburn and you had uh, eight out of 10. You had the Color Purple and Saltburn, but you added Zone of Interest and Anatomy of Fall, which we both did. Great job. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that I remember dropping Dune like right before it was pushed. Smart. To 2024, so. Uh, for Best Director last March, we had, I had Yorgos, Steve McQueen for Blitz, Christopher Nolan, Martin Scorsese, and Celine Song. And you had Nolan, McQueen, Alexander Payne, Alice Rohrwacker for La Camera, and Martin Scorsese. So I had three out of five, and you had two out of five. But not bad. No. Um, I mean, everyone had Nolan and Marty. Yes. Um, and then August, he both got four out of five. August, we both had four out of five, both with Justine Trier and Jonathan Glazer. So go us. Should have just stuck with this. I would have done better with my Oscar picks. You you hung on to to Greta, or I guess you added Greta for Barbie. I had Greta for Barbie, and I didn't have Yorgos, and I ended up, I could have just probably done these four, though, which I did, I think, in the end, anyway. And I hung on to Payne. Uh, for Best Dire Actor, I had, in Mar March of last year, great, Bradley Cooper, La uh, Leo from Killers of the Flower Moon, Coleman Domingo, Ed Harris, Long Day's Journey Into Night, and Jonathan Majors for Magazine Dreams. Whatever happened to that, that movie, Joyce? Yeah, what is that? when is that coming out? Never Did they push that to twenty five. Push. Uh, you also had just this... deleted. <laughs> Did that get black bad girl? Uh, you all then and for Best Actor in March, you had Bradley Leo, Paul Giamatti. There you go. Another. You were very early on the holdovers, and then Barry Keoghan and Jonathan Majors as well. Um. Yeah, and then August we had. The same three. <laughs> or we have no, we have the same lineups. We have the so, same lineups. Yeah. Same exact. And then we only got three. So we had Bradley, Leo, Paul is who I added. I also added Barry, and you had Barry. And then I added Killian Murphy and you added Killian Murphy, the eventual best actor winner. Once we yeah. once once Oppenheimer came out, we knew what we were doing. Yeah. I, again, I, I I never took him out of first. So uh in March of last year for best actress, I had Annette Benning for Nyad. 
That's the way to go. And I had Lily Gladstone for Killers of the Flower Moon because we debated what category she would be in. You had her for supporting. So we'll give that a check for but, you. But well. also remember when we did this last year, we had also done it the year before. And I did have Lily in lead when and everyone had, thought it was coming out in 2022. <laughs> so you had Lily in lead and I had her in supporting that year. And then we did And then we switched and, last and year. Switched. I also had Jessica Lang for Long Day's Journey Tonight, Greta Lee for Past Lives, and Kate Winslet for Lee. You had Fantasia Barino for Color Purple, Greta Lee, Carrie Mulligan for Maestro, Saoirse Ronan for Blitz, and Kate Winslet for Lee. My my one out of five here. Great. Uh, and then in August, when we did it, we both got three out of five. Uh, we each had Annette, Sandra Euler for Anatomy, and Carrie Mulligan. And I had Natalie Portman and Margot Robbie. You stuck with Fantasia, and you also had Margot Robbie. Yeah, so we had again this we again three out of five, just like in Best Actor. <laughs> uh, this is my best supporting actor lineup in March of last year. Is gonna I feel like this is gonna be oh this we, is this is great iconic. This is gonna be what all my picks are like now. I'd say just when we do this again <laughs> in a year. Here's my best supporting actor lineup for last year in March: Ben Affleck for Air, Harris Dickinson for Blitz, Ben Foster Long Day's Journey Tonight, Corey Hawkins Color Purple, and Jesse Plemons Killers of the Flower Moon. Great. You had four, one out of five, but you were much closer to the mark, I would say. You had Willem Dafoe for Poor Things, who was in the conversation all year. Robert De Niro for Flower Moon. Coleman Domingo for Color Purple. Jesse Plemons for Flower Moon, Double Flower Moon. And Michael Shannon for Bike Riders, which was a good performance, but obviously now moved to this year. And you know what? I'll just say right now, I don't have Bike Riders anywhere. <laughs> Neither do I, sadly, even though I loved it. And then in August, it's uh, we had the same lineup again, just like Best Actor. Well, the same correct lineup. Same correct lineup. We had De Niro, Downey, and Gosling. And I we both had Coleman Domingo for Color Purple. You stuck with Willem for Poor Things. And I added Matt Damon for Oppenheimer, my hope diction that never came true. You just swapped Ben for Matt. That's all. Yes. Uh, and then supporting actress, I had two out of five. And you had one out of five, but two out of five because you had Lily here. But, uh, it's I like 1.5. Yeah. <laughs> I had Emily Blunt and Danielle Brooks. And then Viola Davis, Taraji, and Saoirse Ronan for Blitz here. You had her in lead. And then uh, you had Danielle and Lily. And then Taraji, Rosamund Pike, and Isabella Rossellini for uh, La Chimera. And then in August, you went four out of five. You had Emily, Danielle, Lily Gladstone again. So in support. <laughs> and then Taraji and Divine Joy Randolph. Uh, I also had Emily, Lily in supporting, and Divine Joy Randolph. And then Taraji and Julianne Moore. Oh, uh, poor May, December. And then for screenplays uh, in March last year, I had Barbie and Adapted. Way to go, me. Knew that was coming. And then uh, Dumb Money. Remember Dumb Money? No. I watched it on Netflix. It's very fun, as I expected. I had Killers of the Flower Moon, Long Day's Journey into Night. I was just pushed my chips right in the middle of the table on that one. And Poor Things. And you had Barbie the Killer, which would have been a cool nomination in hindsight. Uh, Killers of the Flower Moon as well, Lee and Oppenheimer. I, I I can't believe you didn't have Oppie. I don't know what I was thinking, frankly. What did you say last year this time? I'm not going to go back and listen. And... No idea. I'm sure someone will tell me in the comments what an idiot I was and how I discounted <laughs> Oppenheimer. I can't believe you didn't have Oppie here. You were just all in on long days. I was. I read one Times article about it and I was like, yes, this has got to be oh, it. But this is here. August is when you, you can gloat just like David L. and Evo. So in August of last this, this year, is your, this is your moment. I had American fiction right in Barbie. What happened Barbie. to that movie? Did, did it win any? I think it won. I, I was one of the, I was right there. I had it right away. You were, you were the first one. I'll tell you why I had it. Cause I read the synopsis and I was like, this is going to, this is great. It's going to be, good. that was it. It's like, yeah. And this is before it took Tiff by yes. storm. Yes. So I had American fiction, Barbie. Flower Moon, Oppenheimer, and the Zone of Interest. So four out of five. And you also had four out of five. You had Barbie, Oppenheimer, Poor Things, and Zone of Interest. And we both had Killers of the Flower Moon, which ended mm -hmm. up being a snub, but maybe not. Snubbed. And also, you know, we both had Barbie here and adapted. And it mm -hmm. it tried, it. I mean, it did run original for most of its campaign. And then the Oscars were like, nope, because we knew what the Oscars like to do with, they're very we specific we did. about their adapted screenplays. And then for original to wrap up in March of last year, I had Asteroid City, Blitz, which we'll probably mention again here in moments, Maestro, Past Lives, and Saltburn. And for March of last year, you had Blitz as well, 
you had the holdovers you were all in i famously didn't have any because i was like alexander Payne didn't write it i so. i remember this conversation i'm like it does not matter it didn't matter <laughs> but i will say this if he wrote it he might it might have won i'm just gonna say that I what, think would, it, would it have maybe not maybe the controversy would have come up later uh you had the holdovers maestro past lives and saltburn and then in august we had the same top four we had the same list actually we both missed saltburn uh, but the numbers were anatomy, holdovers, May, December, past lives. Yeah, um, I'll probably just get like one or two out of five in all of these, or like maybe like five out of ten in best picture. Yeah. This year. Yeah. If we're if I get five out of ten in best picture, I would be dancing in the streets. <laughs> this year is crazy. So Joyce, let's talk this year. What were your first? I want to hear your top line thoughts, having looked at this and been in the lab here of what this year is going to be like um chaos but like kind of exciting because i like the reason last year doing this i i remember i i did the like last march really quickly because we just knew a lot of the big titles coming out and you know mm -hmm. flower moon had been delayed like every year basically yeah. and it was like finally this year um we knew op oppy was coming out that had been dated for forever barbie you know, and like color purple, all this stuff. And I th I think it was like easier to clock those. Yeah. Um, And this year, I think, you know, it's, there's not as much of that, like not like, you know, like le brand names, legacy names. And one of the ways I do this is to try to figure out what, like the priority for each studio is yes so i think that's a smart way to do it because we and know it's kind of it's kind of hard it's very hard I, I looked at it this year like this i was like a the priority for the studios b which studios because are they going to have any money to do what they need to do to like push uh -huh. these movies over what legacy filmmakers are coming what the can lineup potentially could be yeah because that's i i have like like placeholder films basically like waiting for the can film breakout what like anatomy. like we didn't have anatomy on our radar at this point last year right like zone of interest and anatomy fall are two movies that i frankly would not have even thought about existing at this point last year right but then i ended up being like the big movies uh then also the narratives and like which actors i think are like people are ready and excited to embrace i try to think i'm like which of the which of these movies will have a, a vanity fair first look we'll have a splashy like august first look uh, as we head into festivals, which actors will be at like Telluride getting their silver medallions or something, you know, like that kind of thing. Uh, yeah, it's tough. This year is tough. Yeah. I mean, like some films, obviously, like Dune moved to this year because of the strikes. Right. Dune and, and Blitz, so, I feel like we'll probably, I mean, I don't know about Dune because I know you were, you were off it last year anyway, but I'm like, I'm on a Blitz for sure. Well, I, like I mean, like we talk about this, you know, like had Dune come out as planned, um, how would have performed? Right. I think it probably would have performed pretty well, but I think this year it has a potential to perform much yeah, better. Yeah, this year I think it could just be like the first one almost. The, the other thing I noticed is, or noticed, but just in general is in terms of like, populist or blockbuster movie there's like incredible there's, there's a lot a of sequels <laughs> a lot of sequels to a lot of best picture nominees right like that are mad or best picture winners in the case right and like i was trying to figure out how will those play to the current academy and also like will they be we've seen them be the in general be willing more to embrace a blockbuster hit maybe not have it win but at least get it nominated right like barbie or top gun and which of these movies this year will file into that like thing i found that really difficult to figure out i don't know well i was like how many sequels am i gonna have in here <laughs> i thought the same thing and I'll, i'm not gonna spoil it but i ended up with it i ended up with, with at least one so uh, i mean i think everyone has at least one uh so i guess i'll start choice I'm so excited. We did not talk about this before, and I have no, no idea. No, because that we we purposely did not talk about it, and okay. I have not clicked over into the spreadsheet. Google Doc. I, I have no idea what you picked. I'm so psyched. Okay, so here's my list: 2025 Best Picture nominees. Joyce, you heard him here first, right? Uh, The Apprentice. Blitz. Right, first of all, are are they gonna come up with a new title for that? Hopefully, 
uh, The Apprentice is the uh, Donald Trump movie that uh, Ali Abbas is directing with Sebastian Stan as Donald Trump, Jeremy Strong as Roy Cohen, and Maria Bakalova as Ivanka Trump. Uh, maybe a can premiere. No studio yet. I have Blitz. Steve McQueen's World War, II, World War II movie from Apple. I have Conclave. Edward Berger's follow-up to All Quiet on the Western Front that Focus will re- release in November. Great I have date, Dune... November 8th. Great date. I have Dune Part 2. I have Emmanuel, which is uh, Audrey Diwan's uh, follow-up to her movie The Happening. Or Happening? Is it Happening? Or just Happening, right? Yeah. I did put Gladiator Part 2 in there. Uh, I have Kinds of Kindness, which is Yorgos Lanthimos' next movie. I have The Nickel Boys from MGM uh, and then I have Sing Sing which premiered at TIFF and is already like making people weep my 10th movie is the A24 drama We Live in Time with Andrew is Garfield is that even going to come out in time? in Florence View I, I'm saying it is it's supposed to be because I, I feel like it's not <laughs> I mean it's definitely done so I went with it to say it's coming out Um, that's my 10th Okay. I currently have nine, so yeah. I need to do a live pick right now and just slot in a tenth. Okay. Here. So I don't know what to do. Let me see. One, two, three, four, five. This is exciting. Um Okay. All right. I think I'll just do this. Okay. So I have The Apprentice. Nice. Blitz. Conclave. Dune Part Two. Mm-hmm. Emmanuel. Hard Truths. Okay. Mike Lee's uh, contemporary I comeback. Almost had it in there. From Bleecker, which I know it's like, but I'm I'm just gonna do it. I I love this pick. Go ahead. I almost had it in there. Joker, Folie à deux. Okay. Kinds of Kindness, The Nickel Boys, and Sing Sing. So the reason I had nine is because I don't have a Netflix movie currently. And I don't I I wasn't sure if I should do the piano lesson. So we'll talk about the piano lesson coming up. I decided against that one, as you could tell, and so did you. Uh <laughs> Could easily make it in. I have no idea, obviously. Um, but I love your list. So I actually had hard truths in there as well, and I took it out because of Bleaker. No, because I just wanted to live in time in there. I just felt like my my thing, like I said, was like thinking of actors who I feel like would make it in. And I also like the idea of the past lives, like romantic drama type slot. And I was just like, I think we live in time could be that movie if it comes out it's from John Crowley, who did Brooklyn, right? Which was like a big nice. Nice movie that people like. Um, and you went Joker instead of Gladiator too. That's interesting. It was between, I felt like one of these is going to make it in. I mean, I, I don't know. I just, I feel like the, you know, Gladiator was so long ago and um, Joker was more recent, obviously. And uh, they they went for Joker. They the did. First one, so. Here was my thinking, and I guess we could do this when we get to, uh, not to spoil it, but I was wondering, I was like, I just felt like it's so soon after the first Joker, even though this one is supposedly more like a musical and obviously we'll have this big part for Lady Gaga, who I'd imagine we'll mention later. Um, I was just like, I wonder if it's too samey. And Gladiator, while it's like sequel, it's so long ago, I wonder if it'll feel fresh by comparison. That said, as we've talked about a lot, like, betting on a Ridley Scott movie to make it in here is always a bad, bad bet. That's, that's another reason. I'm just like, they just seem to be like over him, you know, or at least like this iteration of the Academy. Definitely a bad bet. And the other reason I was again, like, like trying to talk myself out of it was because I'm like, where's Paramount going to be? And this comes out in November, right? There's talks of it being sold. Like, are they even going to be able to mount any kind of significant campaign? But I just looked at the cat. I just look at the cast and I'm like, I think, that will really weigh heavily on like it's I think the crafts obviously will be there and then it has so many actors in it that people like and who are like that I hope I wondered if that would push it over the top if it's unless it's like a complete fiasco which I hope it's not but 
I don't know. I also kind of feel like it's it's a case of like who was really asking for this. True. You know, and it's been so long. You could also argue though that about Joker. But I like but people like do want a Joker sequel, right? Like when after the first one came out and it's like close enough in time. Sure. You know. And I mean like that played, I mean that was divisive and I it it but you know it won the golden lion, right? Like mm -hmm. it just has like, yeah, no, I, it makes sense. I, I, it definitely makes sense. So, I mean, I don't know. I just, we, like, we, there there aren't, like, no, I like, my other options here, I, like, I thought about right. Bird. Yeah. And I was like, I don't know, like, Anora, Sean Baker's film, the actor. So I've then, seen a lot of people pick the actor or talk about the actor, and I'm just like, it seems like a little, uh, based on the synopsis, synopsis at least, it seemed like very genre, and I was just like, would it actually make it in isn't it like a 50s detective story is that what it is it's, or it's a detective like i feel like it might be an acting play i don't know yeah and then i was like do i want to predict noah bombach's movie that's filming right now for netflix if i want a netflix movie in here so that, that's like, not are they gonna rush this out right it could it could and i wonder if that you know we we're gonna hopefully next year we'll be back here at the same time talking about the the 2026 oscars when you look at that year already, you've got potentially a new Tarantino movie, a new Paul Thomas Anderson movie, a new Jordan Peele movie, right? Like there's- ETA like, and IMAX. It's just an incredible amount of movies already like locking in for 2026. And I'm like, I feel like Noah Baumbach, like it would be very similar to what happened to Marriage Story in, in 2019, 2020, because like that probably would have done a lot better in a different year, right? I think you could argue it would have- been a stronger contender than it even was if it came out with a year with weaker competition. And I wonder if No Bombax up against all these legacy filmmakers with a great movie, maybe does it get lost again? So maybe if it is done, do they try to rush it out or put it out this year? I don't know. I don't know. Cause I, I feel like I should have Netflix in here, but I, I don't. So to be fair, Netflix could acquire the apprentice and Run with I know that. so like the apprentice was the last thing I put in because I felt like that made more sense than like Anora or the actor you know so Anora like, yeah I, I love I, I, I'm very psyched for Anora which is Sean Baker's movie with Mikey Madison um but I was just like there in what world is that going to be a major what is, is the academy that cool enough to like focus on that I'm like I don't know I hope so. I don't know I mean like the Florida project you know it died and only got well um and so and red rock and i could see like the apprentice being incredibly divisive like vice um and it's going to be you know a, there's going to be a lot of discourse obviously yes in it's election fall. year that was actually why i thought it would make it in because it is an election year and they'll probably overall maybe put it in but we'll, we'll talk obviously with the actors later um who knows i'm trying to think of what else i had in here how about megapolis francis for coppola's movie i just I, I don't know like again like he's been gone for so long and it's also genre like like maybe like but I don't know if it, like he will get into like director or anything you know where he will get any acting nominations <laughs> um I agree we both have nickel boys in there which is uh the adaptation of Colson Whitehead's um uh, novel the MGM movie I think you know MGM um They've gotten two Best Picture nominees in a row and two Adapted Screenplay winners in a row. And this would probably be in there. Uh, and then Sing Sing, we both have, I got to say, I'm already ready to be like, I think Sing Sing could win Best Picture based on the response in the trailer. That was my hot take. It just feels like so right. I mean, well, everyone was already penciling and Coleman in for this before he was ever secure for his Rustin nomination. <laughs> It comes out this summer, but I do think like A24 could probably keep it in the conversation for the whole year. Um, I'm trying to think if there was anything else that I thought of. How about Furiosa? Uh, I don't know. It's like, again, it's like another, I mean, it's not a, a sequel. It's a prequel. Sure. But sure. I don't know. It's, I was wondering. Like, there's so it, many of these types of movies. <laughs> right. It just felt like there was a lot of those and which, which ones are going to make it in. So you, we both have Dune, which I think feels very safe at this point because of how the its response is bigger honestly than the first one certainly critically a lot of people who are maybe lukewarm on the first one like this one more as a devoted stan of both i'm thinking they're both just great uh so 
Uh, and the box office obviously has been great. Um, all right, should we do director now? Now that we both have, I think we had eight out of 10 match on the film. So this is going to be, should be pretty. Which is, which is wild. <laughs> we didn't even talk about it. That's pretty crazy. <laughs> uh, okay. So for best director, I have Audrey Diwan for Emmanuel. Greg Quedar for Sing Sing. Quedar? I'll figure out how to say it maybe before the year is out. I did put Yorgos Lanthimos in for uh, Kinds of Kindness. Though I wasn't that sure about him. Steve McQueen for Blitz and Danny Villeneuve for Dune Part 2. And I, I'll just for now, I'll put him in. I don't know if he's going to make it in again. For the same reasons he didn't the first time. Oh my gosh. <laughs> you have the same five? No. Okay. But I have Audrey. Yeah. Yorgos. Uh-huh. Mike Lee. For okay. Hard I'm just going all in on Hard Truths. I almost did too, so I'm not surprised. Steve McQueen and uh-huh. Denise. So we have four out of five. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> so again, like with Audrey, that's just like my international slot. Same. And then, I mean, I guess you could say the same for Mike, but you know, he's a, a past nominee. So I had, I actually had Mike in until I put Yorgos in. Because I was just like, why do I not have Yorgos in? I have Yorgos. I don't know like how kinds of kindness would do overall because it's anthology so i don't know um yeah, I, didn't, I didn't go deep on it for acting let's say. yeah me either so but like they clearly like him and his films so i think if it plays well like he could get in um yeah and then i i like at this point right now in march i don't see a reason not to have denis in like will i have him in six months i don't know Right. I, I, we talked about this. The reason he think we presume he was snubbed that year was just because he was not the top pick, right? It's a small branch. He was probably like four or five for a lot of people. And I worry the same thing could happen this year, especially as we said, with like mass, like yeah, Ridley I Scott, have a lot George of tour picks right now. Right. Yeah. Like Ridley <laughs> Scott, George Miller, Todd Phillips, all these like past, you know, nominees or with these big movies that were like I any one of them could be more embraced right than Dune or maybe he misses or who knows what else I kept Greg Quidar in because I was just like it does feel maybe like Sean Hader style but I it just felt like watching well, she she wasn't nominated no so I was like that's why she should he maybe shouldn't be there but I was like I also think that it feels like gritty more way more gritty than Coda at least looking at the trailer I have not seen it I did not go to TIFF I mean listen I'm just gonna reserve a spot for the can winner yeah so makes sense i'll bump someone after after can uh i also thought of france for coppola but i, I didn't have like megapolis in yeah there. i don't i know and then i i thought of um edward Berger for conclave to um I, I think conclave could be a top contender but i just don't think he would get in yeah i don't know um and then Another name I thought of was uh hang on, where was it? How about how about we didn't mention juror number two, Clint? I almost had juror number two reference, but I was just like it just feels like too oddy. It, I don't know. I'm very excited for it. I know it'll be one of my favorites. It feels like the mule. Yeah. Uh I almost thought of Ramel Ross for for Nickel Boys, who would be like a obviously a breakout director this year. Yeah. Um, Already an Oscar know. nominee is a documentarian. Um, like there's Andrea Arnold for Bird, Sean Baker too. How about Kevin Costner for Horizon and American Saga? So here's what I was wondering with Horizon. How does it work with the two parts? <laughs> which See, one do they push? I mean, they're, they're two separate movies. Yes, but they're not really. So how do they, which one do they push? W- whatever does better. Maybe. I don't know. <laughs> it's kind of like how, um, like in Emmy season, like a lot of reality shows, like they might air two cycles in the fall and the spring. So then they just submit their best episode from one of the seasons. Not bad. So like The Amazing Race, you know, like this season it has, uh, or t- today, Wednesday, it's premiering season 36, but it airs season 35 in the fall. So when it gets nominated as a submit, you know, an episode. So or episodes. And so I I you just you just pick 
an episode from one season that aired in the cycle. So okay, I don't I don't know what they'll do here because this <laughs> this doesn't usually happen with the Oscars. We'll find this is a great road test for the Beatles movies that Sam Mendes is doing. <laughs> uh, should we move to Best Actor, Joyce? If you want to, <laughs> I guess so. Here's my five, which you're gonna laugh, or cer- certainly gonna laugh at. I have Daniel Craig for the movie Queer, which we haven't mentioned. It's directed by Luca Guadagnino. I have Colin Domingo for Sing Sing, Ray Fiennes for Conclave, Andrew Garfield for We Live in Time, and then I took Paul Miskell for Gladiator 2. Sure. <laughs> um, I have Daniel Craig. <laughs> Colin Domingo. Uh-huh. Ray Fiennes. Andre Holland for the actor. Okay. And Sebastian Stan for the apprentice. So I snubbed Sebastian Stan. I I can see that. And I was like, I just don't think I think I think the movie I, I was like, are they gonna wanna it could be like Dick Cheney, right? And you get him in there. But are they gonna wanna actually nominate the actor playing Trump in a movie? And I was like, I don't think they are. I don't know. Well, my my thing with him too is like he also like he just won the Silver Bear for a different man too. So he has two movies. Yes. This year basically. Um so like it it could be just like a banner year for him. Like maybe he gets in for that. It's certainly instead. possible. You know. The, the other reason I left him out was I was like, I don't think you're gonna want to nominate someone for playing for Trump. And also like there's been so many parodies of Trump, like I actually don't know how you do it serious. I don't know how you do a serious version of this that could be taken seriously and get not. I just I, I have it. no idea. Like, like I mean, I wasn't even sure about putting it into best picture. <laughs> I, just, I was <laughs> like, in I, multiple places, and I'm like, I, I like I can see them just completely rejecting the movie. You know, I could see them rejecting the movie for sure. Um, but I could also see them embracing the movie and rejecting Stan because I was just like, I don't think that anybody could take it seriously as Trump. I just and I don't think they would want to. And I was like, Paul Mescal for Gladiator 2 is a goof. But also I was like, Russell won for this, right? It's like the same kind of thing. And people love, if it was anybody other than him, I would not have it in. But I'm like, people love him so much. They were trying to manifest an Oscar nomination for all of us strangers. And I was like, this movie is going to be like widely seen. He'll obviously be like incredibly jacked probably in a physical transformation. And maybe it just works and they we get him in. I don't know. And I put Andrew Garfield because- I, I, I just like- uh... I, I don't know, like, again, I don't know if we're in that, like, same era for that type of performance to get in. And then for Garfield, I was just like, if this movie doesn't come out, obviously this is a goof. But I was like, I felt like after he probably, a lot of people are probably like, we should have voted for him for Tick, Tick, Boom. And he was so great in it. And I was just like, I do think, like, the next time he's in, he'll get in. Next time he's in something that's, like, really good, he'll get but- in. But he was nominated for Tick, Tick, Boom. I know, but he should have won for Tick, Tick, Boom. Yeah. But like that, who cares then? Then you should be arguing that he would be winning for this. I think he actually might, but who knows? I, right now, I would say Coleman is probably in the fake lead here, but I could see a, a nice campaign. I just, I just don't think Andrew Garfield not winning is a reason to nominate him. Like that would be a reason for him well, to I win. I think it could be a reason to get him to win too. Uh, but I think probably Ray Fiennes maybe has a great narrative to win depending on that movie well yes because he will be overdue he should have won for grand budapest should have been nominated well i was gonna say schindler's list (laughs) sure he's great Um, and yeah i i don't know because like i i wasn't really high on a lot of the other options so that's also why i went with seb Neither one of us I mean, there's there's like there's Barry Keoghan and Bird. Right. Um, I did think about Paul, but I was like, no. And then obviously Joaquin could come back for Joker. Um, Adam Driver. Um, yeah. and I was I was like, I I don't know. It's yeah, like John David Washington for the piano lesson. I are based on your picture. I already know at least a few of your best actress nominees. I could tell, but I'm gonna read mine, and I think we match probably. I'm gonna guess three out of five. We'll see, maybe four out of five. Uh, 
my nominees would be Lady Gaga for Joker, Foley Adu, Angelina Jolie for Maria, Nomi Merlant for M Emmanuel, Florence Pugh for We Live in Time, and Sergio Ronan for Blitz. I have, oh wait, this is not alphabetical. I don't know. Um, Marianne Jean-Baptiste for Heart Truths, mm -hmm. obviously. Yep. Angelina Jolie. Lady Gaga. Nomi Merlon. And Saoirse Ronan. So four out of five. I knew you had Marianne Jean-Baptiste based on Heart Truths. I, I almost had her. She was my sixth. And I knew you would have Florence. <laughs> Uh, I feel really good about these. <laughs> so. uh, I, you know, like with Angie, I'm just gonna, that, that whole movie could flop, but Pablo Lorraine biopics, like he gets his ladies in. It, it doesn't matter if the movie's a complete disaster. I think she'll get in. And the, the idea of how her, her comeback narrative would be just delightful, I feel like. And then... You know, obviously, I'm all in on hard truths. So, <laughs> I thought of hard truths. Secrets well. and lies reunion. Yeah. Um, and then no me like Emmanuel again. It's like my international slot. So, I also um, felt like no me Merlon to me was like the best supporting part of Tar, and I feel like she was, was your fave. She was my favorite Tar. Portrait laid on fire, obviously great. I'm just like I think, like she's the easy one to figure it could make it in this year and then like Saoirse because you know it's Saoirse um yeah. and and then Gaga I just like tossed in there I I don't know if it'll actually happen but uh I I didn't really know who else to put like I thought about Glenn Close for the summer book and I thought about having both her and Gaga in there for a rematch because that would be fun but i didn't do it and then um you know you you had jessica lang last year but long days is just on the back burner somewhere no one knows what's gave an interview and she was like i have no idea when it's coming out that's why i took it away yeah she talked to vulture a couple weeks ago yeah. like the movie's done but it like it like lost its financing basically and there's like no distribution um i thought about mikey madison for Enora, would like be awesome. the breakout nomination, so and Tessa Thompson for Hedda. What about uh, Emma Stone for Kinds of Kindness, or any of these actresses in that? Uh, I I thought about her, but I don't like because again, because it's an anthology. I don't know like how they're gonna push it. Like maybe they'll push all of them in supporting, because a That's lot of them are gonna be in multiple stories. So I don't know. And how about? The Supremes at Earl's All You Can Eat, which has Uzo Aduba. It's the same thing too. It's like, are they gonna do one in lead and like all like others in supporting? And I also thought about like his three daughters too. Like, would like Carrie Coon be the lead? Like, who are they? How are they gonna do this? Yeah, it's tough to figure out at this point, right? So that's why I was like, I thought I of Uzo. I also I, I also considered uh, Amy Adams for Night Bitch. Oh, that would be hilarious. Uh, I don't think, uh, uh, no, I don't think so. But maybe. I thought of Uzo here because based on, they don't really, I like, there's not a lot out there about that movie, but obviously it's based on a, a book. And I was trying to read the synopsis of the book and like read up on the book and figure out who was playing who. And I think Uzo has like a really, potent, not a, like it's an ensemble, but like she could easily be the lead, I think, based on like what I was trying to figure out. And I feel like she would be a, an obvious like contender as like a actor we love makes good in movies kind of thing you know so yeah but since it's about you know a, a group of them it's like i can also see them just running all supporting supporting around yeah, yeah. Same. so i left I, I just left it out uh how about um um the wicked ladies i almost had cynthia revo in here based on like obviously the pedigree we haven't even mentioned it yet <laughs> I almost had it in, honestly, but I just was like, the trailer looks rough and it just might be an audience play. I don't know. Yeah, and I just, impressed. I don't know about the whole part one thing. 
I mean, I know for a fact, like it'll end. I mean, Cindy's. I mean, I think I, you can figure out the road. Yeah, but I'm like, she'll have like an amazing performance in it, obviously. Yeah. So she could get in. I don't know. Who's going to win? Saoirse Ronan? I have no idea. I think people want Saoirse to win. And, you know, it'll be cool if they go back to the usual way of presenting. Killian can present to Saoirse. Would be great. So. For best supporting actor choice. Let's just say I had some fun here trying to figure this out. I have Kieran Culkin for A Real Pain. Samuel L. Jackson for The Piano Lesson. Paul Racy for Sing Sing. Jeremy Strong for The Apprentice. And Joseph Quinn for Gladiator 2. How many Gladiator? I'll oh tell you why. God. So, uh, there you was think he's going to be the Joaquin? I think he's going to be the Joaquin, even though technically the Fred Hetchner Hetchinger or Barry Keoghan part was like more like the the villainous guy. Like there's two villains basically. I thought Joseph would be the Joaquin though. And also like when they were talking about the fantastic forecasting, there was that report that like the dailies or the, the footage of Gladiator 2 is what helped Joseph Quinn get that part. Like he is like the best part of what the footage was. And so I was like, I want like it feels like he'll have Quiet Place prequel this summer and then this it's like going to be a big year for him and i was just like maybe he'll just get in like why not new hollywood star that we're minting sure um i have kieran slj john lithgow for conclave clarence macklin for sing sing okay and jeremy I just did it to have my Roy boys in there. That's you it. gotta that's have the Roy thing. boys. That's it. <laughs> How would they not do the Roy boys? <laughs> they have to. They have to get nominated together. They have that's to the only reason together. I have them. <laughs> uh, I absolutely think this could happen. Like, so Jeremy Strong, I think, could like easily get in. He plays Roy Cohen in, in The Apprentice. Like, certainly, like yeah. I and I've that. I've heard like some tea. I don't I don't even know how accurate it is, but from someone close to the production mm, actually this is like third hand so wow. you know you know this is let's accurate this. let's hear this gossip. that like roy is like actually a big part in in the film yes so I, I get this I, yeah too. That, so I, 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 so I was like is he actually the lead but then i'm like i'm just gonna put him here i actually think he is the lead and that's why yeah. i put then have sebastian in anyway because i was just like i think the movie is going to really be focused around him yeah because it's like how he created trump yes yeah uh i've seen a real pain i don't know if you got to watch it when it's at sunday no i did not watch that and it's good and it's it's totally totally good and he's really doing like roman without wealth basically you know what i mean it's like that kind of like tone so i i think and i do this is one of those where i was like the industry absolutely wants kieran to like be it's, an Oscar it's just like it's a it's a great um you know like transition nomination yes you know it's it's like it's like uh brian cranston getting nominated for trumbo right after breaking bad and while when i watched it at sundance i was like this is just a really good typical Sundance like a classic Sundance indie yeah it totally feels like a Sundance film that could like maybe not make best picture but could get like screenplay and like an acting nomination and once it got sold to Searchlight I was like it's actually he's actually going to get in because I was like it could have easily been sold to like a lesser or different distributor and I think it would have just been like forgotten but I know Searchlight will do a good job with it and like keep it folk keep it out there and like obviously with him there'll be a lot of interest in it my hot take was that Jesse Eisenberg is actually maybe even as good or better than him, but I don't think he'll get nominated. Uh, we both have Samuel L. Jackson for Piano Lesson. I think this will be like a big push for him to win. Yes, I think he'll be a very popular prediction, especially early on in the season. Complete front runner, right? Yeah, like everyone will predict him. He'll be first in the odds and it'll be the overdue narrative. Yes. Um, so he got the Tony nomination. Right for this he didn't win so i'm uh yeah so i don't know if he'll win i mean i like i haven't picked winners for any of these so but uh i also wonder how much they i i haven't seen the production like any version of it because there was a, a tv movie version of this in the 90s too mm -hmm. but i'm wondering like how much um have they like beefed up for him in the film right too because i understand he has 
um like one key monologue but i do know people who have who saw this production last year that he was in and um a lot of them thought uh some of the other supporting actors like they preferred the other supporting actors to him and they felt like he got the nomination because of his star power right you had Lithgow for Conclave I actually had Stanley Tucci here for a long time for Conclave and I switched in Joseph Quinn I I can having a double noms for Conclave yeah um but I just did Lithgow and I also considered a Stephen Graham for Blitz same um and jesse plemons in some kindness and and willem too i thought willem more than jesse but yes same um i also thought about denzel for your fave so i thought of denzel too and i was just like i don't know what he's playing you know what i mean like i was like it's gonna but hard it's gonna be hard to count him out and like he i mean like he can get noms by himself obviously like roman j israel yeah so Um, i I I don't know if he'll get in for this specifically and so I didn't do him and then but I did think it would have I'm I'm sure some people would predict him getting in and John David Washington getting in to lead actor you know um and I did Clarence for Sing Sing just because I think he will have a great narrative of you know he is an alum of the program great narrative and he really pops in the trailer yeah. so and he got popped in a lot of the reviews I thought of him as well the reason I went with Paul Racy is because it's a like a halo nomination after we nominate him for sound of metal and i do think based on people i've spoken to who have seen it that he is also like makes you cry in this you know so. i think the whole movie will make people cry. the trailer made me cry i'm not gonna lie it was great i can't wait to see this movie <laughs> like totally my shit uh wouldn't it be I, i'm really hoping kieran and jeremy are in i'm just that's, that's all i want that's that's the only reason i did this <laughs> he's so good uh my supporting actress joyce complete chaos i'll just say that right now Here's what I ended up with. Hong Chow for Kinds of Kindness. Daniel Denweiler for The Piano Lesson. Anjane Ellis-Taylor for The Nickel Boys. Natasha Leone for His Three Daughters. And Mark Quayle for Kinds of Kindness. <laughs> um, oh I have God. Hong Chow. Oh my God. Okay. Daniel Denweiler. <laughs> Anjanu, <laughs> Natasha, no. and Isabella Rossellini. I almost Conclave. had her for Conclave. That's awesome. <laughs> we have four of these. I, I had an Isabella Rossellini for a while for Conclave because I was like, it would make sense. Like she's a, obviously like a beloved I mean, I, I just, you know, I just kept her from last year. But you had her last year. That's so funny. I can't believe we have the same four because I was like, this is chaos. I it's don't know. Because like I had like Uzo at at one point. I just had Maria Bakalova so and Joan I, Chen for uh, Didi. I had Joan Chen for Didi and Maria Bakalova. I felt like my my demerits on those was like, Maria get, I got in for uh, Borat, obviously. And I just was like, I wonder if The Apprentice will... I, like, I just can't imagine taking any of that part of it. I know. I was like, I'm not going to do three nominations for this movie. And... uh. Joan Chan, I thought, could easily make it in, but I was just like, is she going to be a lone nominee? And I was having a tough time sticking Dee Dee in screenplay based on, like, where else it is. Though I think it's possible. People really liked her in the movie. Um, Yeah, I went with Double Kinds of Kindness. I just was like, Marco Quayle feels like a person, again, that, like, we're waiting for to happen. I could just imagine, like, the breakout profiles, even though she's obviously been in a million things. I don't know. Um... Yeah, I I don't know. I I just put in um a kinds of kindness actor here cuz I I didn't have room for one in right. supporting actor. So right. I was like I'll do it in supporting actress. And then I I put in Anjanu because I felt like she she will have, you know, goodwill from Origin this year. Frances Fisher will probably run her campaign again. It it feels like this movie is a potential to be a lot more widely seen than Origin was. Yes, or at least hopefully have a better release. And um, and then for Danielle, I think she'll have a lot of pundit support because of her snub for Till. Definitely, that doesn't mean she'll like definitely get in, but like that's this is definitely like a uh, a hot part. 
and I wasn't sure if she would be lead or supporting. Um, Same. So uh, I think having Netflix behind that will go a long way to getting her nomination. Yeah. Like if Netflix yeah. had Till, I think she would have been nominated. Probably. And yeah. so, like, I was just like, I think she'll definitely get in. And same with Anjana Ellis Taylor. Like, if that had a different release, I think Origin could have made more. I mean, more noise at least for her, especially in a Best Actress category that maybe had a little wiggle room. Yeah, as it turned out, um, because for for the the TV movie version of um the piano lesson, uh, Afri Woodard played her part, and she was nominated at the Emmys and lead. So and on in the the Broadway production last year, Danielle Brooks played the part and she didn't get nominated, but I recall her like being run and supporting. Yeah. So I don't know. I feel like both I, I feel like that'll be good. And Natasha Leon, again, kind of similar. Yeah, to this theory. was I was like, I feel like they might do her in supporting. <laughs> I think they'll do her in supporting and it feels very similar. I've heard that she's like incredible in the movie, like from people who saw it at TIFF and then from the reviews. But more than that, I also felt like it's definitely like the TV, act, like the actor we like makes good and let's give them like Kieran style. Like it's almost the same kind of narrative, I feel like. And like people really like Natasha Leone, certainly. I feel like she'd make it easy. And yeah, especially I feel like they, they could run all three of them, like her, Elizabeth Olsen and Carrie Coon in supporting. Or mm -hmm. maybe they would do like Carrie in lead and Latasha and Lizzie in supporting. I don't know. Uh. And the last two categories we have are the screenplays, Joyce, which based on what we said, I'm not, I would not be surprised if we have very similar lineups here as well. This is absolutely freakish, but I guess we've talked enough about this in general. Screenplays both. were very hard for me. Uh, so for Adapted, I have Conclave, Emmanuel, The Nickel Boys, Queer, and Sing Sing. Um, I have the exact same. Right. Right? Conclave. <laughs> Emmanuel, Nickel Boys, Queer, and Sing Sing. Amazing. Why Why do we have so much overlap? It's a psychotic. Because we were looking at I, I thought we were going to have so many different picks. We have the exact same. <laughs> I also, I thought about the actor in here. Um, I, I considered Dune, but I was like, I don't think so. I think he lost the Dune screenplay nomination when he was like, a a dialogue doesn't matter. Di dialogue, I, I'm not into dialogue. So while I think the movie will do really well, and I don't think it'll hurt him as a director nominee, though he might not get in, I don't think, th I think that'll be the punishment will be- I mean, you know, we didn't even mention any Dune actors. Well, I'll tell you what, it's going to be tough. I think there was a hope, but people want Austin to manifest, but I just don't think he's in it enough. I, I mean, I think Javier Bardem would be better. And truthfully, the best performance in the whole movie is actually- Timothy Chalamet, who's really quite good, but I just don't imagine he would get into this field. Yeah, I just, I can't really see any of the actors getting in. Like, I think they're all good, but um, I mean, like, Denis hasn't gotten any of his not actors in any of his movies nominated. I mean, we all remember Amy. So, and yeah, I think there will be a heavy um, online push for Austin, but I... I, I just don't think there's like enough um heft in the role. Like it's not even like he, I mean he's not in it a lot and supporting, so it doesn't matter, but I just think there's like not enough like dimension to the character either, because it's just like he is sinister and it's more about like people being wary of him. I think there's a world you know? like you're hoping it, you would hope that it's like uh, Anton Chigurh, but it's really not like that. He's just not. Yeah, it's not like that at all. Like, like I, there's been so many comps to to Anton yeah. and, you know, Heath Ledger. And I'm like, those those are actually quite different. And I, I don't really think he gets like a big moment to really shine and flex no. his acting muscles. No. So um, I, I don't see it getting any acting nominations, just like Same. the first one. Uh, and then for original screenplay, let's see if we end up with the same five, then, Joyce. This will be fun. I have a real pain, actually. Blitz, His Three Daughters, Hitman, and We Live in Time. So probably not, because I know you're not on I was I was waiting for you to mention Hitman. So Hitman is the best, but I think it'll show up here in screenplay with Glenn and Richard Linklater getting the nomination. Um, I have Blitz, Hard Truths. Okay. Of course. His Three Daughters kinds of kindness 
in a real pain. Nice. Funny. So we have four to five yeah. <laughs> again. Yeah, I I don't know. So I didn't put kinds of kindness in because I was like, Yorgos, when it's himself writing, he doesn't get nominated. I was like, it's not Tony McNamara, so that's it. I'm like, I don't he's got a different They, they only writer. like Tony. They like Tony. I don't know if they like him. And that means this is more gonna be like maybe this will be a little more strange, like killing of a sacred deer. That's why I'm not or who knows. I don't know. I I mean like it's anthology. I have no idea what it is. Like it's uh, I just, a, I, I can't even imagine, so. A real pain, I think, would work because just basically, like I said, I, I think people like it. Just, it's a Jesse Eisenberg script, so I think there's, like, room. I almost thought of Dee Dee here, but once I took Joan Chan out of supporting actress, I was like, I don't think it's going to make it in here, though I think. I mean, it could just case. be a lone screen. It could be a lone screenplay. Uh, His Three Daughters, I think, could work really well. I love Hitman, I think, is just good. So, I don't know. You just want Academy Award nominee Glenn Powell. I do. I mean, the movie is fantastic. So if it was me, it would be best picture, best director, best actor, best actress. But it's not making it in, in these categories. So, um, we we haven't mentioned um, Parthenope, um, Paolo Sorrentino's movie. So, I've seen I've seen predictions for it, but I'm like I don't know. So I thought of that too. Uh, Gary Oldman is like the one recognizable, I think, main actor yeah. in it. It feels like it's definitely in that uh, auto fiction style of Belfast and Roma. I get the sense, right? Yeah. So it could definitely, I feel like if it's a can, I mean, certainly an international play. I thought maybe like the lead actress in that, but I wasn't sure who it was. And I was like, maybe she gets in too, but. I, I, I think like Gary is supporting in this, but like the film is, it's described as a love letter to Naples. Yes his hometown so certainly can make it elsewhere i know and then i'm like maybe it could be like screenplay i don't know maybe screenplay maybe international feature um anything else that we thought of this is great i can't believe we get so many the same these are all going to be wrong that's (laughs) it makes me so happy though that we're wrong i was doing this and i was like man to be wrong together i was just i can't wait to see what joyce does because this is gonna this is so different we have so much overlap we have so much overlap. We have four to five in every one of these. Four to five in director. Uh, four to five in actor. Oh, no, three out of five in actor. Okay, that's good. So that one we were really different on because I went with Andrew Garfield. Uh, four to five in actress. And then supporting four out of five or three out of five, but we both have Sing Sing in there. So sure. It'll be double Sing Sing. Four to five in supporting actress. Same adapted and four out of five or three out of five in screenplay. It's crazy. Oh my God. I can't wait to look at this in wow. March. I mean, in you August. Mean August. August. I can't wait to look at this in August and see where we are. Um, I mean, like last year was fun too because we had Barbenheimer in the summer. So yeah, I don't think we're not, like, not going to have that this summer. No, I don't think so. Uh, uh, Joyce, we can go to emails now while we let these sink in. I can't wait to leave. Email us about these picks. I don't know if we're going to, we're, we're going to go into Emmy. So we just, just tell us how wrong they are. Just tell us what you think. Leave in comments in the video. I'll maybe read them. Yeah. Chris, Chris reads the comments. I don't read the comments. And then he just tells me the comments. So I'm just, here's emails at slugfest at goldderby.com. I'm just going to read. We have so many of them about the Oscars, about 2025 Oscars, about everything. But this one's from Vivek. Who writes, which succession actors will have a bright future in movies? Which one of them will be the first to get an Oscar nomination or even win? Well, is, is this your burner? <laughs> it's not, but we have both Jeremy and Kieran nominated together. I mean, the universe just needs to make that happen. Who would win if you had a, like, can you imagine what that will be like? The discourse between Jeremy and Kieran on op, not in the same show. So they don't even have to play nice. But like, why wouldn't they play nice anyway? Well, they like, might they play nice, but I'm like, the, the discords wouldn't have to play nice. I'm sure they like each other. <laughs> I would hope. I like, I mean, I, they, they'll, they'll be su- such different performances. So imagine it's just both like, of them in which there. Because then... like, Jeremy is transformative. Right. Both of them in and... there with Samuel Jackson on a historic, like, gotta give Samuel Jackson an Oscar narrative. <laughs> That would be absolute chaos. I, I mean, like with with Samuel Jackson, I could see it going multiple ways. Like he could very well be just like RDJ, you know, like 
it's his time or it could just not pan out like a hope diction that does not pan out like people are just really hyped on it early on in the season mm-hmm. that like this veteran is gonna win um and i don't know like maybe like people are not into the movie or just they like another performance more um but i mean like succession i in the the cast in general incredibly talented so um i mean it just depends on film roles for them and um like matthew mcbanion is in holland michigan (laughs) so let me we didn't bring up that holland michigan and flint strong i kept conflating these two as the same movie but they're obviously not uh I thought of Flint Strong, which is an inspirational sports drama. It's coming out in August that I was like, maybe it gets a screenplay nomination or even a best picture if people really love it. I didn't put it in, but. Yeah, and, um, you know, like Sarah Snook is on stage right now. She just got an Olivier nomination yesterday. Future, future so. Tony nominee, probably. If they yeah, and like, and Jeremy is on Broadway right now, so. Um, but yeah like i i think you i think you can see a lot of them or maybe not a lot but like several of them get oscar nominations in the future i think i think so joyce this one's from dakota hi there joyce and chris long time listener first time emailer you know the drill i have a question that i figure you two may know the answer to well definitely joyce maybe would not chris are the short films eligible for their categories at the Oscars outside of their respective short category? For example, if someone was a big Wes Anderson fan and really had wanted to vote for Henry Sugar in production design or something, would that have ever been possible? I know it would be extremely unlikely to ever happen. I'm just mostly curious to know about if it could. Um, yeah, I mean, I've never thought about that either, but I, I don't see why not. Right. Did you see Netflix is releasing so. uh, all the shorts as one movie yes yes i did see that. interesting yeah interesting <laughs> interesting choice uh this one's from nadia emailed us at slugfest and com. hi joyce and chris i only recently started following the oscars this year when i started getting more and more into the movies before i guess you could consider me one of the quote normies i started following the race through both podcasts and social media i even reactivated my twitter account which was definitely a mistake wow and i deactivated yeah, mistake I deactivated this morning because of the pylons over analysis of every person's interviews, the way they accepted their speeches, who they hugged, who they shook hands with. It's kind of insane. I really enjoy your podcast because you guys were one of the only ones that don't seem to have a parasocial relationship to the movies and nominees. One thing I've noticed listening to a lot of podcasts is the obsession with award show acceptance speeches. I typically ignore Twitter, but even podcasters who I generally feel have one foot in reality are weirdly critical if someone doesn't react their, to their to their win the way they think is appropriate. Like, for example, people were criticizing Divine Joy Randolph for reading her speeches and not being spontaneous, or more recently with Robert Downey Jr. cracking jokes and being sarcastic instead of, like, crying. I thought it was weird because even at the Oscars, I liked his speech, but it seems like a lot of pundits thought it was bad because he didn't get emotional. So that means he's ungrateful or the award didn't mean anything to him. Do you think there's an expectation that uh, an actor has to react a certain way to win to their Oscar? Because I kind of find it bizarre to judge someone you don't know for reacting to their award in a way that you don't agree with. Maybe they don't like getting emotional in public. Maybe they're happy to win, but they also don't view it as the most important thing they've ever achieved. I never thought there was anything wrong with that, but I find it interesting how people project onto celebrities' reactions. It's from Nadia. Is this your burner? Yeah, then this might be my burner. <laughs> <laughs> um but but my my twitter account is still active right now so True. not not <laughs> uh yeah um I, yeah I, it's very very weird when uh people do that um you know like everyone just loves to overanalyze and scrutinize um public figures i think people people don't know how to treat celebrities as human beings right. like they think they're entitled to their attention and to their behavior and they must behave in the way that they the viewer approves of just like with the speeches Mm -hmm. you know and i think people especially in this day and age they're pretty outraged about everything a lot of that after the oscars there was a lot of fake outrage about every single thing that people didn't like including yeah. Uh, Michelle Yeoh and Emma, Emma Stone's reaction to Michelle Yeoh to the point where Michelle yeah, Yeoh had to be because like, first it was RDJ 
quote unquote snubbing Ki yes. Kwan, and then it was like, oh, uh, Emma allegedly also did, and Michelle be like, you fucking bitches, and post on Instagram about it. <laughs> she didn't say that exactly, but she was very much no like... paraphrasing, but like she, like that's the only reason she did it. Yes, uh, <laughs> and I would say this about Devon, and I do. I'm one of. I mean, you know, I think. The perception of the speech is always an issue, right? You want to be seen as being yeah, good yeah. You you voting. like a speech, but you're you're not telling them how they should no. deliver their speech. I do you don't think care about the content of their no, speech. No, I, I do think there is a visibility. Like people will take it different ways, and that could affect whether they want to vote for them. That said, I will say like the Vine speeches were all really, really strong and very well thought out. But I thought her best speech was the Oscars because it felt mm-hmm. like it was the most genuinely emotional that she was able to be. And maybe that's a re- a negative reflection on this whole process that. She had to wait until she won the Oscar to be as like authentically emotional, maybe as she could have been elsewhere. Not that she wasn't emotional when she was reading the speeches, but they felt way more calculated, I guess, than this one did in a good way. I just felt like it, the the whole like written speeches thing, the the criticism of her written speeches was so misogynistic. Yeah, because everyone was complaining about her other speeches, like you know her reading them. And it's like why is she reading it off a piece of paper when RDJ did that multiple times too, and no one gave a shit. His were laminated. laminated. Yeah, he laminated his fucking speech. No one cared, but they were always just dragging Dave Vine about it. And then at the Oscars, she has no written speech and she just speaks from the heart and is super emotional. It's a really great speech. And then they have to criticize her for not mentioning the movie. I'm like, why did she? This is her moment. She can say whatever she wants up the there. Done now. And and you know, you know who also didn't mention their movie when they won? Core Jefferson. Like he mm-hmm. gave a great speech imploring studios to bring back mid-budget movies right like he didn't really thank um amazon or mgm like he didn't even mention jeffrey or sterling or anyone Mm -hmm. like he was just he was making a point right he didn't think and like no one cared that he didn't thank jeffrey he thanked them enough i'm sure yeah but then like davon gets all the heat because she didn't mention alexander payne and paul giamatti for the 57th time so it's like it's like they can't win it's like bradley cooper like nothing they they do on stage when they're giving a speech like someone's always gonna nitpick something and um like like it's happening to ludwig like as soon like i knew this is this is how online i am because as soon as he said at the end like thanking his parents oh uh thank you for giving me um instruments when i was a kid instead of video games i'm like he's he's like the gamers are gonna come for him online and they did (laughs) you're too online you've lost context Joyce or maybe you no, but like context. I knew but like I knew that was gonna happen no yeah I know I know like it's we tough. all know what he meant there right I'm, let me let me just think a wild suggestion what if social media was really bad and shouldn't exist oh you, you don't say uh this <laughs> like everything is taken in bad faith so it's just oh, like ridiculous uh this email is from Dominic Joyce. Email us at slugfests at goldderby.com. Hi, Joyce and Chris. This is Dominic, a relatively new listener from the Philippines. Oh, I was overwhelmed. I have a lot of Filipino yeah. listeners. Yeah. yeah, great. I was overwhelmed with the amount of score showboating in the last Slugfest, when throughout the season, I've always felt that the predictions were second to the celebration of the films in your discourse. I'd like to say my thanks for you guys, since the Slugfest has been a great respite in my work and studies ever since I discovered your podcast through the Oscars playback series. It's so fun hearing people passionately talk about film and TV, and I feel like both your voices are strong and and unique in the space. Anyways, my question for you is unrelated to all that. What are your personal favorite plaid color combinations? I've only ever owned blue and dark white, uh, blue, dark blue, and white. I'd love to hear from the experts, though. Many thanks. That's from Dominic. Wow. Are we plaid experts? I mean, I wear it every time. I, I like this one. This is a relatively new one. It's like a little green and blue. Yours, I thought, was black, but it's navy. Yeah, but it's it's dark blue. So this yeah. is navy. So Dominic would like this. Yeah, that's a good one. Um, I I think like my I you can't just you can't go wrong with red. Yeah, I like red yeah. too. I like yeah. a red, and uh, I actually like the, I one that's like a little Christmassy colors because it's like red and green. Oh and green. yeah, a great. Color. I have I have a dark green. I really like. I like to wear that in the winter because sure. it feels wintry. Um, I like the red and black combo mm. too. In the summer, I wear short sleeve ones, and they're like blue, like a picnic table tablecloth. I like that. I had I had a real um like it's like super old now, so I don't really wear it a lot. But I have a, a yellow one. Sure. So it's like a light yellow. Yeah. Great. Uh, this one's from a loyal listener, Nancy Joyce. Hi, Joyce and Chris. What are your thoughts on the controversy over the holdover script being allegedly plagiarized? 
It was interesting that Variety published that article the day before the Oscars, despite the issue had been ongoing since January. Had it won original screenplay over Anatomy of Fall, it certainly would have been awkward. With the upcoming WG Awards in April, will it impact its chances of winning, assuming its nomination doesn't get rescinded? No, because voting for that closed on Friday. So the timing. That so was think, not an accident when I'm, it dropped on Saturday. I'm sure. Uh, I will say you read the article and you're like, oh man, that sounds rough. Because there's obviously a lot of like circumstantial evidence maybe. But the, then the article uh, itself makes a very compelling case. But then you read the the similarities and uh, we're not legal experts. So I have no idea how this will play out. But if you, as a layman, reading the two scripts or the examples, I was like, I think it speaks more to not, uh, and I use this not as a pejorative, but in the uh, typical nature of the holdover script uh, is like, it's like a very conventional story. And so there is a lot of similarities in like overall story, maybe, but like not really in details. That was my- Yeah, point. like if, if you look at, because the variety story had the, it's like 33 pages of PDFs, like, yeah. the, you know, um, his argument basically. And it's like laying out like the comparisons and you're like, oh, he really had something here, but then you actually read it. And it's like, this is actually not like word for word or even line by line. Yeah. And a lot of them are- it feels like a reach um right and I, yeah like i do think it's it's more indicative of again um like you said not a pejorative but just how uh formulaic a formulaic or i was gonna say like classically structured the holdovers is yeah like it it that makes it sound bad but it's it's not because um like like movies like and like uh, not just movies but just like a lot of art exists on tropes Right. And right. like tropes are not necessarily bad, but you that you just need to like do the trope in an exciting way. Right. You know, or a really good way. So but right. I think when it's just yeah, it's kind of like just kind of classically like laid out there like that. Like it it seems maybe more similar than it is to something else. Mm -hmm. Like none of the beats are really out there in the movie and you could like describe the movie poorly and it could apply to like a bunch of other movies basically right. I, th you know? I think that's true it's just like a grouchy guy like bonds with um a grouchy teen right right uh but I yeah i that's not gonna impact no WGI or something. uh this one is from alicio hi joyce and chris it was no surprise that the best performed songs at this year's oscars were the ones that were actually used in their film why don't the Oscars change the rules so that only songs utilized during the film can be eligible for nominations? There is literally no other category where something during the end credits is eligible, so why should song be any different? This would help end our era of Diane Warren's generic trash being nominated, especially when we had options in movies like Wonka, Theater Camp, The Color Purple, Wish, etc. Surely there are better songs than, that one, than ones that rhyme inside with vibe. Another fix would be if voters were forced to watch the song performed in the context of its use prior to the nominations, not a clip reel in its entirety. These songs aren't that long. It shouldn't be that hard. That is from Elicio. So Diane Warren, if you happen to be watching this, do not direct any uh, ire toward me for reading this email. Um, Diane Warren apparently wanted to speak with the manager at the Oscars. Yes. That was in Matt Bellamy's recap yeah. because they didn't read the names of the nominees. I think while... I thought most of the production of this Oscars was wonderful. I would say that's something that they will not repeat is not repeating the nominees. It doesn't. Yeah, say that, that was that was a bad call, and the the producers um, talked about that. I think in Variety, like the yeah. day after, and they were they like their reasoning was basically to save time because you already heard the songs performed, and I'm like, um, sure, but that doesn't really work because the performer is not necessarily the songwriter, especially in this case with Diane Warren. You know, in in both the picture and song where they made that choice. The problem is, yes, the movies and songs are nominated, but the people, like the producers, like Christine Vachon was like, yeah, I like if read the name. producers' names, yeah, right, like it's like you could have, like she's never been nominated, like like let us hear our names. That's like a pretty big moment to be able to hear, yeah. Your name. And then and then they were win. also saying like, oh, you you just like heard the you saw the performances all night, or like you saw the best picture clips all night, and like yeah, if you were watching the whole show, but a lot of people just tune in, especially for Best Picture, they tune yeah. in at the, the last, like, half hour, right? Like, they weren't watching this whole time, you know? Like, this is a nice recap. That felt like a uh, 
like a hat on a hat choice. You know what I mean? Like just like one too many choices. Yeah. And also I feel like at the very least, just have the package ready. And if you really, really need to cut it for time, then cut it, but at least have the option there. Cause in this case they were running short. I know it was not a great, oh. not a great look, but anyway, what do you think about this idea to change the rules for song? I would love this personally. That that would be great. Yeah. We have way too, like too many people abuse, um, you know, the end credits loophole. Like you just need to be the first song played in the end credits and you could submit. So, because like, I mean, that is like, you know, in theory, you want this, the song to have purpose in the film. And that's not to say that an end credit song can't share, you know, can't be like thematically connected to the film, but it, it does mean more like if it's like part of the movie, that doesn't mean the song needs to be diegetic, right? Like it doesn't need to perform, it could just like play over like a scene or something. Yeah. Yeah. You know. Uh, this one's from Jonathan. Hi guys, great show. I was wondering if you have anyone you'd be interested in seeing host the Oscars, specifically for the first time. For a while I've thought Robert Downey Jr. as Hugh Jackman was great. Maybe even throw in Chris Evans as co-host, or is it too late with both of them no longer part of the Avengers? Comedians and talk show hosts are always great, but every so often I like a change. It's from Jonathan. I don't think either of them would do it. Like I can't see RDJ doing it and Chris Evans won't even host SNL because of his anxiety. So he will absolutely not host an award show. <laughs> uh, I mean, for me, I mean, I'm beyond, con- I, mean, I mean, I think we talked about this on Sunday night, but Mulaney would be a great host. So hopefully they actually do have him do it. But I would, I mean, recency bias again, man, you know, to have a blast, Ryan Gosling, it'd be awesome. Yeah, but I also feel like he's not exactly like he is as talented as Hugh Jackman but he is not like Hugh Jackman in like personality Mm -hmm. you know what I mean like Ryan Gosling is one of my favorite celebrities because he understands how silly and goofy like everything about Hollywood is like he's very serious about his work but he's totally unserious about all the bells and whistles and that's why I love him right and I I feel like that I feel like that's good in doses, like for like, I'm just Ken on the Oscars, but I don't know about hosting a whole show. Who else do you think then? Um, I I mean, I personally, they would never do it. I personally would love to see Conan do it, but I think he's like too weird. Yeah. For them. And he's yeah. not movie. No. And, and then he no longer has a show on late night either. So. I think people would um, say like The Rock. He's always a I mean, The Rock wants to do it. Like, I think I think he might be good to I I also fear that he might be another Neil Patrick Harris situation where everyone wanted Neil to do it and then he did it and it was okay. Yeah. So I think, you know, Mulaney's two auditions have been good. So I, I think, think Yeah, I think he'd be really well. good at it. Yeah. But I also would be it would be, I think he like, so a lot of people don't like Kimmel because he doesn't like the movies because he dares to say certain movies are too long. But I'm like, I think he doesn't mind the movies, certainly. I think, I think he likes the movies. Um, Like, and I think like he, he interviews a lot of these people, like they promote their movies yeah, on his show. And he's like, like I, I watch your movie. People. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's like actually friends with like all these famous people. The thing with Mulaney, I feel like is that it would be way, he does seemingly obviously also like the movies, but I would say like, it would be more like it would be more like orbited around his comedy than like it is around yeah. Kimmel's comedy. You know what I mean? And I wonder how that would, would people actually, you might get more people to watch it. And like you said, everybody would be really excited about it. But if, if Mulaney's doing like a tight six minute, seven minute monologue, that's like very funny, but is it going to be too focused on him and not the movies? And then would people be mad that it's not about the movies, right? Like, I don't know. Yeah, and it's just like what because like we know he can do a set, right? Like that would just be his monologue. Um, and and it's like what is he gonna do bits too? Like you know, like someone like Jimmy or like any late night host would do a bit. Right. You know, so yeah. uh I don't know. Um and yeah, I like if if and when Mulaney hosts, like someone's gonna have an issue with it. Oh yeah. So, uh, this one's from Ellie Joyce, who actually reached out to me on Twitter yesterday, needed a oh. Slugfest email address to email this. So I was like, I'm definitely going to read this, obviously. Dear Joyce and Chris, 
I wanted to let you two know that I am very thankful for your weekly Slugfest this award season. I have followed the Oscars for well over 10 years, but this season is one I was the most invested in following through online communities, especially as I was sitting at home recovering from my battle against cancer. I have learned Aww. I passed the one-year cancer mark cancer-free a few days ago. Congratulations, Allie. Uh, your, you and Joyce's uh, brief was one of the few awards coverage that I felt was grounded in logical reasoning and respect for all competitors. Just like many, I was very surprised at the silly discourse around Killian Murphy and him winning even after he had won both BAFTA and SAG, which culminated with that GQ article you mentioned on Monday's recap video. You and Joyce were one of the few that I can count on half the fingers on my hand that weren't shy of addressing and rebuking the silly discourse based in logical fallacies. As someone who takes empirical, statistical, and logical approach to predicting the Oscars every year, my frustration grew each week. Looking back, I am not surprised Critics' Choice was the one televised precursor not won by Killian Murphy, as the majority of folks having this discourse were voters for that award. You have earned yourself a forever subscriber and supporter. I will miss you two until next year's season goes into full swing again. As a Christopher Nolan fan, I'm so happy with the outcome of the Oscars and that Killian Murphy, whom I've discovered only a few years ago through Nolan's films, wasn't left out of the Oppenheimer train as so many were hope dicting to happen. Sincerely, L. Oh, thank you, nice. L. I'm very happy you're healthy. Yeah. Um, uh, why did I have a feeling it was going to delve into Killian? You just knew. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you what, Joyce, spoiler alert, we have another one of these later as well. Oh, great. Can't wait. I can't wait. We need to, we need to get, uh, read all of them now. That's the last chance. So, um, was there even a question? I, there was no, just, it was mostly just like, uh, I, oh, I, gassing I, us up. Great. Pretty much Thanks. gassing us up, which obviously I love. But, uh, but you know what? I was thinking about, um, critics choice because we we know how much they love to predict the oscars and you know they they went basically all in on barbie mm -hmm. and um a lot of people were using critics choice to predict some below the line categories like costume design and production design yeah and they gave those to barbie so i will say based on the way the discourse shook out i think what l says there is right in that the loudest dissenters to poor things are a lot of people who seemingly vote for Critics' Choice Awards and the loudest uh, fans of- But Emma, Emma won there. <laughs> right, but not like production, you know what I mean? But not like production, like where Barbie won, I think there was a lot of like poor things haters, right? Maybe in that group? I don't, I don't know. I think it's weird because if you remember in, in the fall when a lot of like the regional critics groups were announcing- like, and and the ones that had below the line categories a lot of them went with barbie too mm -hmm. and i don't know if it's because it's members or their members had not seen poor things yet so it was like a visibility issue because you know like everyone saw barbie but i i mean metacritic no longer has it's a, a scorecard for awards but like I'm sure Barbie's like like ultimate um production design total dwarf yeah poor things I, because of the regional critics awards so uh, after the Oscars on Monday Joyce I watched Poor Things again first time I've seen it since oh, I watched that on on Friday yeah and uh I gotta say banger banger of a fucking movie it's so great and I was like as you know I'm, I'll ride or die for Barbie for the rest of the time. But I was like, every single one of the wins that Poor Things had on Sunday were completely deserved. And actually shocking that it even won because it's so it's so good. I was like, I'm actually surprised they went with this because it actually is so good. You know what I mean? Like, it's like one of those movies where you're like, oh, this could easily just lost because it's too good. It's it's funny because um, like watching it at home, like I had a better view of Willem's makeup than I did when I saw it in October. <laughs> I thought the same thing. Willem's makeup is is phenomenal. Uh, the production design, though, is out of this world. I think it's so great. And the costumes are phenomenal. And I really was like, I can't believe it didn't get nominated for visual effects and it would have easily won. Oh, yeah. Like, easily. So. And Emma is... Just, just like Adapta. And Emma is truly like DDL and There Will Be Blood to me. I'm like, that is like an all-time performance. It will go down as one of the great performances, I think, of all time. She's so good in it. It's it's better. I know you're a La La Land stan, but it's better than her La 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 a La La Land performance. I think personally La La Land's a better movie, but I do agree with that. I think it's like, um, this is like a legitimately all-time performance. Yeah, like you may not have wanted her to win, but uh, like the 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 win and the performance will age very well. 
La La Land, her win, and this happens sometimes, is you're in love with, I think you are char- so charmed by the character and the actor that it's like an easy thing to imagine winning, right? You know what I mean? It's like Jennifer Lawrence in Silver Linings. Is yeah, like and it was, that, that was a very much just like J-Law, like an It Girl coronation moment. It Girl coronation playing like a rom-com character who everybody loves. You know what I mean? It's like yeah. just easy to fall in love with. And you know what? It's also cool that both of her Oscar wins were for comedic performances. Yeah. So. Uh, this one is from Kara. Emailed us at slugfest at goldderber.com. Hi, Joyce and Chris. This is Kara. Since I know you'll be talking about your 2025 Oscar predictions on this episode, I figured I'd ask a question about one of my most anticipated movies, M- Mickey 17. Bong Joon-ho's follow-up to Paris that was originally set to release this month, but has been delayed to January 2025 due to the strikes and post-production delays. My question for you is, do you think that the January release date indicates that the film's quality isn't that great because studios usually dump bad movies in January, although allegedly it was the next IMAX date available? And do we think now Bong's films will always be predicted for Oscars because of his success with Parasite? Moreover, is predicting him for this film is predicting this film for Oscars overblown because he seems to be returning to the kinds of genre films he did pre-Parasite? Anyway, we'd love to hear your thoughts. Thanks. That's from Kara. P.S. Getting it down for posterity, I think Blitz will win Best Picture in 2025. Mm, okay. We'll check in in a year, I guess. Kara, email us next year if you're right. Though I think you might be right uh, <laughs> as well. So Another one for Apple. Um, Yeah, a lot of people were very upset when Mickey 17 was moved to January 31st, 2025. So definitely not an inspiring date. No. Uh, that said, I also don't know if it'll hold. You know what I mean? Like, isn't it possible they just move it to later in the year? And again, like, it doesn't mean that it's going to come out then. I think a lot of people are hoping that will just be the wide release and it'll have, like, a, a platform release, like, in the fall or something. But that would be absolutely, that doesn't work. I, I just, <laughs> I don't think that works. I think that's that, what people want because they they want this to be in the conversation. Right. I, I don't think that works ever. We saw that with Origin where it had like the one week, not to bring that back around, but it had like the one week release and then it came out like in mid-January. It's like, no one's remembering this is like an Oscar movie anymore. And it I came think, out after voting closed. <laughs> so with this one, yeah, I don't know. Like, I think it could possibly, like, I understand that it's, I think that IMAX thing is right. And clearly like Warner Brothers is prioritizing IMAX. And so they made like the Paul Thomas Anderson movies coming out like in August next year, August, mm-hmm. I think ninth, And it's like in IMAX. So I think we've seen now that there is an audience, especially with Dune, with these premium format screens or whatever they call them, right? Like that there is a lot of money there for people to get. And like, especially the big studios know that. So I'm not surprised if that's like part of the reason, but I could still see it moving to like May. I don't know. Or, you know, who knows? I guess. I know it's in that January spot now, but who knows? Well, it was originally supposed to come out March 29th, which would be in two weeks. Also yeah. not a great spot. Um, but Dune is here. And then, but, but like, because first it was just moved off the date and then people were hoping it'll hit festivals, right? And then it was like, no, January. I, I definitely think the vibe was it's going to hit can. Now it's not. Yeah, it was like, it was like can and then like maybe fall festivals and then it was like no January. Mm-hmm. Um. Uh, but I, I do think like because this is his first film since Parasite that people have high expectations Definitely. for it and are like, you know, expecting like a, another film that the Academy might eat up. But I don't know, this this could just be like a populist play too, you know? So Maybe. Uh, this one's from MJ Joyce. Hi, Joyce and Chris. I've listened to you for a while and enjoy your weekly discussions. Uh, do you think the Oscars would ever release the vote totals if, say, the entire Academy voted in favor of it, and more so release totals if all the nominees and winners in a given year were dead? I personally don't think they will because it's only us Oscar nerds that care about it, right? Ha ha. Also, Joyce, do you think uh, Wozniacki can win another major in this current <laughs> era now that we have no Serena and basically Venus Sharapova, Kleisters, Hennen, etc.? And what major would be her best chance? That's well, I guess Australia because she's won there before, okay. but I think I think she needs to be more aggressive because she is a uh, you know she likes she likes to moon ball and stay in the back, uh, very defensive. But um, I think you know in in her return, she has 
added a little bit more firepower kind of like how um Alina Svitolina has since coming back from maternity leave mm -hmm. just a lot more aggression you have no idea what I'm talking about yeah. but um I don't remember the original question <laughs> oh bow uh, totals yes uh, I don't think they'll they'll never do it but they they should when everyone in a year is dead would be great because like they they can't do this especially you know for like contemporary years because can you imagine like all the publicists and strategists they'll lose their minds we have another vote total another one vote coming up we can talk about it more but uh this one's from gina who is an old pal and has emailed us a lot and writing in again hi joyce and chris another award season complete just wanted to thank you both for everything you do for this community when it comes to predicting the and predicting the shape of award season thanks gina I know my emails are usually on the longer side. This is true. That's me editorializing. And I can't help myself sometimes. So aside from the minor shout out to my poor things winning makeup and hairstyling prediction coming up to fruition, I thought I would send you a shorter email with a fun question game challenge. I actually submitted this following the nominations announcement. That email was too long, so I wanted to put it here instead. So that's true. I, I think I edited that. In light of the nominees in the four acting categories, lead actor, actress, supporting actor, actress, rank each contender based on their film's poster design. For the sake of this conversation, assume individual character posters, if there are any, do not count, i.e. Gosling and Ferreira's individual Barbie posters. For example, if I were to rank film posters in the best actor category, I would personally say uh, Killian Murphy, Coleman Domingo, Paul Giamatti, maybe Jeffrey Wright, and then Bradley Cooper in that order. I hope you're doing well, and I can't wait to hear your coverage of the Emmys. Much love. Yes, Joyce, we're not done. We're going to do the Emmys starting next week. Can't wait. Um... Yeah, we're going to lose a lot of uh, Oscar listeners because a lot of Oscar people are not Emmy people, but <laughs> Emmys are where it's at. Stick around. There's a, you know, do you like Lily Gladstone? Because she might be up for an Emmy. She, she, this she year. could have an Emmy nomination this year. So. Do you like Jodie Foster? She might win an Emmy this year. So that's good. Uh, um, you know, Bradley made a cameo in Abbott. Yeah. Guess I don't actor. think he'll get nominated for a guest actor. Though. Maybe. <laughs> uh, this is so hard. I actually don't know. I will. I mean, I need to Google the posters first. Why don't we just talk about the post for like, this is so, I don't want to like, this would take a while. I would say my favorite poster of this whole lot is Anatomy of the Fall. I thought that was the great poster. Yeah, I love that poster. And so I would rank that number one for best picture, for best actress, for best director. I thought a lot of these posters were not good, personally. You didn't you didn't really like the Oppie or Barbie posters. I don't like either of those. I definitely don't like the Killers of Flower Moon posters. I thought they were rough. Those are, those look like, um like Costco novel covers really tough uh holdovers i know people enjoyed but i just was not that much of a fan um that was fine i like the one because there's like multiple ones yeah. of them i like the like the broken ornament yeah one and maestro is like okay like it's just their faces um american fiction yeah like not mid. a great look i just think that it was a tough movie to market i don't know how you could have done it yeah and... what if they did like book covers book covers like killers of glamour like the color purple poster was also not great bob what was that just not a good one not good i mean not yet it's just the two of them and like it's also funny like the netflix ones where are these posters even exist i guess like bus stops and like they're not in movies yeah either. they're they're like i've seen them in bus stops okay so. joyce i got david l here so let's read this one how long is it is there an actual question there is okay Hi, Joyce and Chris. It's David L. Sorry, my last email didn't have any questions. I'll make sure to send one every email again. That's like a threat. I've got a few questions. If you could answer them one at a time, Chris. Jeez. First off, did you think... So what, first off, what did you think of that ridiculous in memoriam segment on Sunday night? I cringed at watching the ballet dancers, which reminded me of the horrendous Debbie Allen numbers of the original score nominees. It also felt not only disappointing to the people who had passed away, but the viewers watching at home who wouldn't know the people's contributions to cinema. My question is, uh, oh, okay, that's the first one. Then he goes into his next question. I thought the memorial was rough because I couldn't read the names. Yeah, as soon as they, when it started and um, they, it was such a wide shot, I was like, everyone's going to hate this because no one can read the names. Usually they, in the past, I mean, I feel like in the past I've seen it, they start wide and then it cuts to the, the image behind it. Yeah, the actual montage. Very strange. Yeah, but no, they had to get all the dancers in and mm -hmm. in the shot. And I think I think award shows are getting too cute with in memoriam segments now. Just play the montage. That's it. 
do the montage, play a song. It's just Shut because the crowd. you're supposed to be honoring these people who are gone, right? Right. So just show their faces, and for you know the high profile ones, like play a clip or two, but just play the montage. Like we don't need like dancers, and I, I mean you could have like someone singing because they've been doing that for a couple of years, but you could just like you know uh, do that a uh, show show the performer in the beginning and the end before you start the montage and after mm-hmm. the montage ends. You know, we don't need, like, going, like, in and out of the montage. Um, and then it was bad at the end, too, when they just had this mess of names on the screen and you can't read anything. Next question. This is the last time I think you could ever say this, so I'm just going to read it one more time, Joyce. My question is, last year around this time, you both didn't listen to me about Killian Murphy, Robert Downey, and Emily Blunt on the acting nominations only because... Past Nolan films haven't gotten them despite Oppenheimer being a biopic. So do you think now that Killian Murphy has deservedly cemented himself as an Oscar darling, could he get an Afterglow nomination for his upcoming film, Small Things Like These, after the great reviews the film got out of the Berlin Film Festival? The only certain Oscar predictions I've got right now are for next year are Killian Murphy and Kieran Culkin for A Real Pain in Best Actor. Hmm. And Kate Winslet for Lee and Marissa Abella for Back to Black, the Amy Winehouse biopic. And Daisy Ridley for Young Woman and the Sea, the biopic of Olympic swimmer Gertrude El- Elder- Ederly, based on the book by Glenn Stout. Have you read that book, Joyce? I know you love Olympics. I have not read that book. No. We didn't talk about that one. Sure, I guess. I don't know. Could be Nyad. Maybe. You know, back-to-back swimmers. I, uh, back to Black, I don't have the highest of hopes for, but we've seen- No. Those- I mean, like, I-, I thought about it, but I didn't really, really consider it. But um, again, I love this- indicate or implication that we had a conversation with david l about our oppenheimer picks last march i also had emily blunt last march i had her in there we went back and looked it's uh, i got it written i love that it it, it, like he makes it sound like we were arguing with his picks last year and also like we don't care who anyone picks like why would we tell you not to pick someone (laughs) uh um but yeah sure killian could get an afterglow nomination like that got great reviews um out of Berlin and Emily Watson won the supporting Silver Bear. Yeah. So, and he also produced this movie too. So, and real pain if Kieran was lead, I would just be absolutely blown away. He's supporting. I've seen it. So, he's not a lead, but he can get I, it. It's, it's more like, I mean, it's like, I, I feel like, I mean, I haven't seen it, but it just feels like that classic situation where it's, you know, um, like two leads, like it's about two people, but they're going to split them. Yeah. 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 Uh, this one is uh, from Tatenda. I mean, this is slowfestivalgoldberg.com. Hi, Joyce and Chris. I wanted to take a moment to express my deepest gratitude for the content you've provided throughout this award season. As someone who isn't particularly invested in and doesn't know much about film awards, your videos have been a source of insight and joy for me throughout the year. The Barbenheimer phenomenon caught my attention last year and was the one that got me interested in film awards because I really got curious as to the, how the two movies would perform awards-wise. Uh, listen to this. This is more gassing up, Joyce. I'm sorry. I'm so, if you're reading, if you're watching this, and you're like, are, again, are these your burners? No, I did not write this, but I will read it. What truly sets your work apart is not only your extensive expertise, but also the genuine chemistry between you two. Joyce, your depth of knowledge is truly impressive, and Chris, your perspectives add a unique layer to the discussions. <laughs> I like that. Wow, that is one way to put it. <laughs> <laughs> that is the greatest diss I've ever read about myself. Joyce, you're a genius. And Chris, you bring a good perspective uh, to this. <laughs> oh, hang on, let me finish it. While I don't think it'll, I'll closely follow film awards again in the future as I did this year, unless of course there was another Barmanheimer phenomenon, I wish you both continued success. By the way, I'd love to know, what are your top favorite movies of all time? That's from Tatenda. Wow, thank you, Tatenda, for that. Literally tearing up laughing. That was great. Uh, top movies of all time is so difficult. I don't know, Joyce. I, I mean, would... what are, what is like the criteria for that? Know. Is that just like movies I love to watch over and over again? It's definitely changed a little bit, but it's still like all the all, all the usual like film bro, film posters and dorm rooms movies for me. So, I mean, like the movies I watch over and over again are the Mighty Ducks trilogy, oh, um, so. Ten Things I Hate About You. Oh, that's a good one. And um. And my my favorite movie is Saving Private Ryan. So, yeah. which I did watch a lot for like a year after it came out on pay-per-view. <laughs> um, and then I watched it, I guess it's two years ago now when we did um, Oscars playback for the 90s. Right. So that was the most recent time I watched it. But there's, I mean, yeah, like I, like 
I would not say those are the best movies of all time, but like those are the ones that I watch a lot and enjoy watching. I don't know what I would like list as all time movies. I don't know. So, I mean, we, you would you have like Goodfellas, yeah, Goodfellas, Pulp Fiction, all the same shit. Uh, this one is from Mike. He emailed us. Hi, Joyce and Chris. Love your work and look forward to my first full 12 months of following you. Get ready for wow. Emmys, Mike. First of all, and most importantly, all hail the Gosling and his Kennergy. But here are my questions. Jamie Lee Curtis, period. Not one of the best Oscar wins, but one of the best demonstrations of how to win an Oscar? Not the campaigning, but she did so much with a very thin role, and I always thought this and her obvious popularity in the industry over her career is what got her over the line. Side note, wasn't Stephanie, Stephanie Shue a co-lead? Yes, but also, sure. I think Jamie Lee definitely played exactly right how to win an Oscar uh, mm -hmm. with her as she won. So, yes, I agree with that. Yeah, she saw an opening um, and she decided to go for it. Like, she she said it on Graham Norton and this was also after Michelle Williams went lead. And, and yeah, like, her campaign was really good because it, it, she, like, she was, I, I, like, she was, open about the fact that she wanted it for herself but i think she was also really great about championing everyone else too like not just everyone and everything everywhere but other artists um like people were like making fun of her because she was also hyping up kate blanchett for tar mm -hmm. so it was like oh my god is she betraying michelle you know but no she was just was like supporting a bunch of people too and and yeah like obviously her her career and her name have a lot to do with it as well. But it, it was a really good campaign for, for someone who no one was predicting that August, you it, know? It's not my favorite Oscar win at all. I don't think it's a lot of people's favorite. <laughs> but I will say, I think you could absolutely say she was the most important, most important part of the Everything Everywhere campaign in that she is so beloved in the community and has such like long reach into the community that I think for a movie that maybe people thought would be weird or divisive. And I'm putting those in air quotes, having her there to champion it really made a difference for a lot of probably older voters and her being like, yeah, look, pay attention to this. You know what I mean? Like that, you cannot discount how important that was to get that movie over the line in the end. Yeah. Um, and you know, like she, she still does it, you know, like she still posts, um, about like her, her pro like not just her but like her projects like i mean she's been posting about the bear like every single bear win you know just like the bear doesn't need extra hype get ready for her to win but, an emmy yeah uh, get get ready for her a uh, guest emmy yeah in september uh next question from mike joyce maestro which i loved i thought it was a beautiful and compassionate telling of the bernstein's relationship definitely handled by cooper as a director it had issues but so do most films however it had been released to theaters how many oscar nominations would it have gotten to me, it's a beautiful old-fashioned film that would have ended up like last year's Babylon. Interesting. So, like, do you think it got more nominations because it was on Netflix? I I think it would have just gotten the same. I can't see it getting more. The only reason I could see it getting less is I think part of the reason Babylon Babylon was divisive, probably more so than Maestro. But once Babylon flopped, it was like, you're not going to pick a loser. You know what I mean? Like, it's like easy to throw away. And with oh, Maestro- So how much money do you think Maestro would have made? Nothing. $5? <laughs> like, what? who's going to see that movie? It would have not made any money, I think. And it would have been a huge flop. And more so, like we've seen, because people love piling on Bradley, it would have been like, the headlines would have been like, Bradley Cooper's Maestro flops, colossal failure, that kind of stuff. I think the thing with that, like they would have been, they would have needed to be very strategic with the release. Right. Like it could not have gone wide, you know, no, it ever. needed, it would, it would have needed to be a very slow, um, limited platform rollout. Like maybe like just like five theaters opening weekend. Right. You know, like it, it's just a way to like maximize numbers and to like fudge it a little bit to make it seem like, like the PTA is better than it is, you know, mm -hmm. and just like a gradual rollout and you never really like you never you never hit a thousand theaters you know yeah. it like i think they would have needed to do that but if they went, went wide like i agree like it would have flopped but i think it could have done quote unquote well you right. know or okay. just like on par with um a limited 
release and i think it would have just gotten the same nominations i maybe you know yeah. like as I mean, said, like, who, really... who was who was like gonna I mean, you know, we joke and say like Nyad was 11th, but I think it was a distant 11th. Yeah, and this year it felt like while this was a good year for movies, there was no 10th movie that would have knocked out Maestro. Yeah. Like the only thing I did was after it hit Netflix and the general public's reception was uh, not great, like I moved it to 10th. Like, and I also never had it like higher than six or seven. Like right. after seeing it, it was just like, it's not your conventional biopic. And, you know, it was just like a really big swing by him. And it it was not a, a grand slam. No. So. Uh, last part here from Mike. Quick personal note, Emma Stone and Poor Things changed me. The performance was that effective. Always was my winner, but I could have been on board with Sandra, Lily, and Carrie also, although I haven't seen Annette. Oscar voting is not a competition. It's a preference that comes with an accolade and an award. To that end, I think they should never release the voting stats because whoever was third or fourth or fifth in today's aggressive, let's drag people down climate would be derided rather than being one of the five nominees in a field of thousands. That said, I would still love to see the stats, but surely it would never end well. Oh no, it would never end well. That's why they, they can only do it for when everyone is dead. <laughs> From like Put it in like a time ago. capsule and like pull it out. Yeah. Uh, this one's from our old pal Harold and Maude Joyce, who we found out, if we are a long-time yeah. listener, is actually named Aiden. Mm -hmm. Hi, Joyce and Chris. I hope you're doing well. Looking at the slate of films possibly contending at next year's Oscars, I find it hard to believe we'll get a ceremony that will top the one we just had. Dune Part 2 and Sing Sing both look to be incredibly strong contenders, but I'm having a hard time filling out the rest of my Best Picture lineup without including a bunch of blockbuster sequels. I have a hard time seeing Joker 2, Dune 2, Gladiator 2, and the Mad Max prequel all in the same lineup, and even considering they all come from Oscar favorite IP. And while I think Dune is more deserving of winning most of the technical awards, I'm wondering if you guys think a later release could maybe eat into some of its wins. This is looking to be a long off season with the Emmys being completely dead this year, so I look forward to your guys' videos every week. Emmys will be even more chaotic. So, uh, It's tough. Like we said, like going our looking at these things i mean like all those sequels all got multiple like gladiator joker mad max or furious or whatever right dune that's like how many nominations of the previous films gladiator had how many let me see um but but that's like i mean can can you really because that was 24 years ago too yeah i know you but know. i'm just saying like um 12 nominations for gladiator is that right <laughs> jesus um yeah i won five right yeah and joker it, had how many nine or eleven um eleven um but i i think like with gladiator it's just like because the first one was so long ago it's hard for me to include them with these other ones that were within the last decade right i the one movie i uh, just to, to his point the one movie i thought of as like a possible tech work like like upstart to me was well wicked which we discussed could be like production design costume design right like makeup and hair certainly you could see if it's like really good it definitely can compete in those categories and then i also thought megapolis just because of like who knows right like it's a big genre sci-fi thing or supposedly i don't know yeah um i i mean like i think like dune dune had it you know it, it was lucky last time just because of like COVID and the slate. Right. You know, there was so, no other movies like it in the lineup. Yeah. So it won six. So I think it will probably have more competition this time below the line. Yeah. So, um, and I don't know if they'll get 10 nominations again. We kind of talked about this. I mean, I think it's in play for a lot of those same nominations, but yeah, like gonna... I don't have it in adapted. Right. I think it'll miss that. And I think Denny could miss, even though we both have him in. Yeah. Um, I definitely think Dune is helped by the fact in terms of these blockbuster sequels to Oscar movies that it's leader in the clubhouse and that it set the bar. We already know it's great and it like has been very well received. It made a lot of money. So it, it's out in front in a lot of different ways. And now these other movies kind of have to play catch up to that level, basically. Yeah. And also, I mean, I'm not saying Dune is going to win Best Picture. I don't, I don't think no. it will win Best Picture, but the last two Best Picture winners opened before the fall. Well, that's why Sing Sing is my pick, Joyce. Another July Best Picture winner. <laughs> uh, 
few more here before we wrap up another epic length episode. This one's from Todd. Hi, Joyce and Chris. Now that award season is over, which of your predictions are you most proud of? And which dumb ones will you always laugh about? Oh, I mean, you have so many. Dumb ones? Oh, yeah. I'm proud of American fiction. That was my main one. Yeah, you, that that is your calling card for the <laughs> season because that was in August. That was good. Uh, which dumb ones? Take a pick. Which ones? Which dumb ones of mine did you love, Joyce? Um, I really enjoyed when you dropped Sandra Hewler in, in the fall because you you announced it like live while we were recording and I was like, why? <laughs> I, don't know. Um, I also enjoyed when um, Maestro was getting eviscerated, um, you know, the last week of December yeah. um, and you, you replaced it with the color purple. And again, I was like, why? Incredible. <laughs> so good. I don't know. What else have you done? I mean, like you said, I change them much more frequently than you. So uh, I move everybody in and out. I would say the other one I'm really proud of is Leo missing. Yeah, you you were very, um, uh, you 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 were like one one of the first people to be like he he could miss. I was an early adopter of the suggestion yeah. that he would miss, even though I had him in and and picked him many times. But I was like, I just don't think there's a passion there. And then you you made twenty bucks off of it. So I did. You might feel like you have many good ones, Justine and, and Alexander. I, I mean, uh, well, yeah, all of these, all the holdover stuff. Uh, yeah, I, I, I had holdovers a year ago. Yeah. Um, and I, I guess like I'm happy I was always high on anatomy because I think you dropped Sandra in the fall because that was a very uh fallow time for the film and yes. there was not a lot of hype and so you're very reactive I try not to be reactive in the moment so I always like you know I kept Sandra like I had Justine um I, and with anatomy when I dropped it you're right because it came out and no one was talking about it but actually to Neon's credit uh no one was talking about it but then they they were talking about it in great detail by the end of the year right you know what i mean like they did a great job maximizing the visibility yeah of that it movie. was it was just not uh talked about online and i think right. we kind of a lot of people use like the the people conflate like twitter buzz or like online buzz with like real life um i guess i mean i guess at this point i have to say i'm i'm proud to have had killian since july since that became so fraught <laughs> yes i think that's good um and I don't know. I guess I'm also proud to, you know, like no no shade to her, but like I was always low on Greta Gerwig getting in director for Barbie. You called that. I, I was like, I did, never wanted to believe it, but you are exactly right for why. I mean, it's the same reason why Denny would miss for Dune, right? It's just like yeah. not a passion. It, there's not a lot of number one passion for that, maybe. Yeah. And again, it's like not, nothing to do with her. It's just like the the habits of that branch basically right. that's the other yeah. thing the branch is, yeah. is a tough beat. so i mean i don't know i mean is that you know what i think we should do we need like i i feel like you should get credit for calling snubs because i feel like that's that's like a huge part too well especially because it's hard i feel like you you almost it's not even like a bullying but there is such an obvious like lure of the group thing where you're like man everybody's predicting leo to get in why wouldn't he get in like, yeah. what am I doing wrong? It's like the I'm same thing with Greta. Yeah. And like, I I don't know. I guess like maybe there, there should be like, for each category is like, you know, who is not getting in and you have to write like the name, you know, like Greta Gerwig is not getting in. Because <laughs> I feel like, it. it's like, yeah, I feel like that a lot where I'm like, and I'm very susceptible to group things. I'm like, well, I guess I should listen to this because everybody, I almost did that with the final picks with costume design and Barbie because everybody was breaking I, Yeah, you were texting me like for days about it. <laughs> I was um, like, no, I'm not doing this. This is, I would have done this if it was old me, but new me is going to be more practical and say- You're, you're changed. Um, my dumb ones- You don't have any uh, dumb ones. I, I, I should have never dropped a net because I was always, always high on the net yeah, in the fall. Were. I had her for months and then I dropped her and then I actually put her back like around like BAFTA noms and then I dropped her again <laughs> before yeah. Oscar nomination. So I should have yeah. just kept a net. Um, I should have stuck with the holdovers for casting at BAFTA when I literally said, like, looking at the past four years, um, the casting winner, the film had also won a, an acting award. Mm -hmm. That was smart. And I should have just stuck with Divine and helped with BAFTA instead of trying to, like, gild the lily on that. 
and predictors. I know, but I love like when you just like make a dumb mistake. Like, and also oh. I should have just stuck with poor things for makeup. Like, after, when I feel really like, I had it after nominations, and then I, I, I feel talk so myself out of it. So stupid about that one because yeah. I was like, we knew all year that they didn't care about Maestro, but I just was like looking. I just couldn't stop looking at the past winners, and I was like, Maestro fits so easily with these. Yeah, it does because like all of them were leads, and some of them had won, right. and then it was like Willem also wasn't nominated yeah. i there were i think i a lot of my dumb ones are just like i had stuff for a long time and then the last minute i changed it because i also had sterling and sag for the longest time mm-hmm. and then right before noms i dropped him amazing <laughs> uh this one's from lois hi joyce and chris love the show i saw an excerpt from a Holo- uh, hollywood reporter story floating around twitter that mentioned people of color who won at sag but then failed to win the oscar as if it was some kind of conspiracy. The excerpt itself feels disingenuous when it leaves out someone like Glenn Close. The industry is to blame for a lot of things, but I feel like the reaction to Lily losing to Emma has gotten a bit out of hand. What's your take on this? Because that was an article about uh, Killer's Flower Moon being shut out and other surprises, and then it said, still Gladstone is far from the first actor to lose the Oscar despite winning SAG, a list that includes Denzel Washington for Fences, Idris Elba for Beasts of No Nation, Chadwick Boseman for Ma Rainey, Viola Davis twice for Ma Rainey and The Help. Yeah, I saw that on Twitter as well. And my first um, reaction was Idris Elba was not nominated for the Oscar. Right. So that's just wrong, first of all. And then, lose the Oscar. Like, he couldn't, it wasn't even a competition. Yeah, you can't lose if you're not nominated. Right. Um, and, and But then, yeah, my second thought was exactly that. It was like, this is just cherry picking for clickbait, for rage bait. Because it's like, yes, um, you know, they excluded Glenn Close. Like, she is not a person of color. And she won the SAG and she lost the Oscar. And then um, there are a ton of white people who have won the SAG and lost the Oscar, like Annette Benning, you know, um, Paul Giamatti, um, Christopher Walken, you know, um we, Russell Crowe lost to Denzel. Uh DDL. There's um, a lot of uh Lauren Bacall. Know, like <laughs> we know SAG loves a narrative and loves its stars, right? And like I think if you look at these like in that excerpt, which I just in that looked. excerpt, the reason those people lost is like they lost to people with a stronger film. They lost to people with a stronger film. Denzel lost to lost to Casey who was right. dominating the season and that that was basically the only award that Casey lost right. and Denzel at that point also had never won an individual set yeah well he had no sags because um he didn't win for training day and then glory predated the existence of right. sag so Chadwick lost to, obviously famously to Anthony Hopkins mm-hmm. I, I mean which also won know. adapted screenplay and was a best picture nominee the father mm-hmm. And then Viola lost twice for Ma Rainey, where she lost to Frances McDormand for Nomadland. That, again, makes a lot of sense. Losing for the help, I don't think it's like, I mean, that I think you could argue maybe she should have beaten Meryl, but we've seen that. Yeah, Oscars like that, like that I mean, that like the help is stronger because it, w- it was a Best Picture nominee than the Iron Lady, but that's also like the Beatier performance too. Right. You know, Honestly, and I also think... one makeup. <laughs> I actually think if it was now, I don't think Meryl would have won for the help. I mean, for the help. Imagine Meryl's in the help. I don't think Meryl would have won for Iron Lady. Excuse me. Uh, also, Emma just added another Oscar win for the help cast, man. They're just just racking them up. <laughs> but yeah, that was a, you know, very selective listing of uh, people there. And then, yeah, the the discourse is bad. So It's not know. great. But I don't know. Like, what else is there? Log off. Time to, to log off. It's, yeah. Uh, this one's from Nima. Hello from Ireland, Joyce. We got a, Fili- a Philippines uh, listener and an Ireland listener today. Uh, we're all excited and proud of Killian here. Thank you for never doubting him. Looking to the future, what type of film or TV show would you like to see him do next? And do you think we might one day see him back at the Oscars? Uh, I I think he could definitely come back. You know, he could come back for small things like these. Um. He he doesn't have any like film project on the radar. Yeah, like he's he's an EP on 28 years later. Um and I, oh he signed on to that Netflix film um a couple weeks ago too. What about the rumor like that he, can, he can play Bond? 
Did you see that rumor? I don't think that's going to happen. That was like, he was asked about that, like at some event a couple of days ago. And he was like, he he does not want to play Bond. I, I think he's even, even though Pierce Brosnan is like, oh, he'll be a perfect Bond. <laughs> Isn't he? I mean, he's a little old, I would say, probably. He's 47, but remember, GQ called him a boy. So. True. Maybe that's um I thing. yeah I I mean I don't know like I he he can he can do anything you know like he's he's a great actor and um I I he never plays like the same type of character twice I don't think or like he he finds like a different way in to like even similar archetypes yeah you know and obviously there's still the Peaky movie on the table right um if that ever gets done. So I, I would love to see him on a series again. That'd be um, cool. Yeah. Uh, we have three left. So we'll try to do these quick. It's been a long, it's a long episode, but it's worth it because we're not going to get to talk about this until August, I guess, again. Uh, Hydros and Chris, now that Killian Murphy and Michelle Yeoh have both won Oscars, which actor from the underrated movie Sunshine will be next? That's from definitely not Chris Evans. I feel like we've gotten this e- uh, from we've gotten emails from definitely not Chris Evans before. Uh, Sunshine star Chris movie. Evans wants us to say Chris Evans for this question. Yes, definitely, definitely not Chris Evans. We want us to say Chris Evans. But what do you think? Um, well, first of all, I was very happy to see that photo of Michelle and Killian from the Oscars. She's like smiling at, she's like beaming, and she's like grabbing his face because we were denied that reunion on stage because she didn't present. Mm-hmm. um best actor yes um so the next sunshine cast member um rose Byrne, maybe um our fave from shogun hero hiroyuki sonata i was gonna say hiroyuki sonata actually it would it would be great uh or benedict long also great uh yeah and... benedict would be good um i think like those three chris evans i don't <laughs> believe would win one I, i'm just gonna say that <laughs> I, I love Chris Evans, but no. I love Chris Evans too. I'll tell you what, um, I mean, in another world, I think he would have been nominated for Knives Out. He's great at Knives Out. He, I guess, so like the net, he he just joined uh, Celine Song's next movie. So that's his next thing. That has the potential. Um, that has potential. But I don't, yeah, I, I don't know. I've always felt like of the Chris's, um, Pine would be the most likeliest to win an oscar he'd be great but he also um ha- hasn't been on the scene in a while too true he's so got i his- would love hemi to win one can, and i feel oh. like he would he would win in the same way that like brad pitt would win because he's like really good at comedy so i would love to see him win for like a, a comedic performance maybe furiosa is he funny in that i don't know he's got a funny <laughs> nose uh this next one's from jackie hi joyce and chris love this show Everyone was, quote, mad at Al Pacino on Monday for seemingly ruining the Best Picture announcement. We now know the producers decided not to run a clip package or announce the nominees. But honestly, I say bring on the chaos. My eyes see Oppenheimer is forever funny. (laughs) To that end, which actor should present at next year's Oscars in hopes of yet more drama? That's from Jackie. Yes, we need more of that. If, If you did not enjoy that moment, then you're boring. Like, that was great. I'm sorry. (laughs) <laughs> uh i i got like name. listen i love jane fonda taking that pause before saying parasite but this is equally as great this is great my eyes yeah. see oppenheimer i feel like we make fun of that forever i and that going forward it should be by law that every award show it, instead of saying and the award goes to they need to say my eyes see i would pick diane keaton i love her loopy nonsense and i think she i mean she really she fun. did um she presented with Keanu yes. to Parasite a couple years ago when yes. she was a loopy. I think she'd be fantastic. That would be great. God- yeah, and they could be Diane. like, hey, it's it's the 51st anniversary of Godfather. Let's bring her back. <laughs> Let's keep celebrating Always Godfather. anyone from the Godfather. All the Godfather. Sorry. Every year is an anniversary of the Godfather and they're always going to celebrate it. But it was just so funny that they, they specified that as if Al Pacino could not present Best Picture without a hook. Like you could just say presenting best picture out, but you know, and everyone would be like, yeah, it makes sense. Like you don't need to mention the Godfather. Yeah. Um, yeah. So anyone from the Godfather that it was also very ageist when people were like, you cannot have like senior citizens presenting best picture anymore. And I'm like, no more of them, please. <laughs> like, it's great. It is like great. we get moments like these. Yeah. Uh, and Joyce, here's the last email of Oscar season. This is it. Next wow, week. Better be a to- good one. 
Next week, we're on to Emmys. So get your Emmy emails in now. Slugfest at GoldDerby.com. Can't wait. Talk to us about Shogun. But the, the honor goes to Julia. Hi, Joyce and Chris. What was the weirdest narrative this award season, besides you guys apparently hating Austin Butler? <laughs> well, nothing would be weirder than that. <laughs> did, we, did we hear from Rachel again? Never. About why she never wrote we back. We never got she, her back. She will hate us now because we're not predicting him for next year for True. June. Yeah. Um, weirdest narrative? I don't know. There's so many. Um, uh, I'm trying to think. There were. It was. It was a year of takes. I mean, only recent. Again, recency bias. But I felt like the the Paul Do stuff was just irksome to me because it was so phony. It just felt like we were trying to push a narrative that wasn't the actual narrative on them, and that was like weird. Yeah, and that that was really just within the last two months. Like, yeah, and because it was like once like um all all hope was gone with bradley it was like let's like transfer this overdue narrative to paul and it felt like just really kind of sweaty um again as of like he was the only person in this lineup it applied to right and also it felt like it was overlooking his performance as well it was like so much focus about like how everyone loves him he's been around it was like narrative by omission because like yeah. yes like he wasn't the only one to have it but like no one else was mentioning the other nar- other people who also had the narrative so it felt like you're being disingenuous to pretend that you're not just pushing that narrative onto him uh not a narrative the other thing i loved about the season was lily gladstone is the heart and soul of flower moon that's that's up there to me with uh there could be a hundred people in the room uh with lady gaga i'll never forget it is a, the small film with a big heart of this year uh, and I love it so much. Yeah, and and uh, that uh, I was gonna say something like similar to that because like just within the last couple days, because like of course like the whole like should she have gone supporting debate, um, sure, has been riled up again, and a lot of like the you know the the Lily defenders of her running in lead like that that like they were <laughs> that that was their reasoning that was the rationale that like she's the heart and soul of the film so of course she's the lead um and you know like i again she could do whatever she wants and like it, it's done it's over right like she chose to go lead and um came very close to winning and she, like we don't need to relitigate her decision but i wouldn't say that like being the heart and soul of a movie makes you the lead i mean i know i agree and I, I I would I would say usually if you're the heart and soul of a movie, you're probably not the lead. That's why you're the heart and soul of the movie. We had the nuanced take, I think we both did from minute one, where absolutely she should run lead if that's what she wants. And yeah. I understand why she did. And I think she rightly did. Mm-hmm. But as a viewer, to me, it was she was not the lead. Of, she's the lead actress in the movie, but the movie is not about her character. And so if you want to say that makes her a lead... You can, but the movie is about Ernest, not about Molly. Yeah, like watching it, I I thought, you know, she, like the character was supporting because it was like basically like her and De Niro's character and their impact and influence on Leo's character. And I absolutely understand people who think she's a lead um, and I get it. And again, I don't care where she ran. And I think, you know, she you know, she championed herself, like, going lead, you know? Right. And um, positioned herself as a lead. And that's great. And it's, like, same thing as last year, like, you know, Michelle Williams, like, I think she's supporting in Faye Lemon, but I don't care that she went lead. Like, good for her, you know? Right. Like, I that's mean, the I harder do. thing to do. Um, But, yeah, like, in, in Flower Moon, I think... I think, like, the, the story is about the Osage, right? So, like, in theory, it's about her character and her family um and her marriage with Ernest but like her her performance is not at the center right like I think like her 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 character might be at the center like as an Osage woman but like the performance is not and I think that is what is like the sticking point in the debate with people who think she's a lead and people who think she is supporting right because like you know screen time is not everything but 
in a three and a half hour movie, she is gone for a long time. So like the performance is not centered, right? 56 minutes is a lot of time to be on screen, but not in a three and a half hour movie. Right. I totally so. agree. And, we, I, and we're never going to talk about this again, probably. Or maybe we will next year when this kind of comes up again. But I was just, I mean, like, yeah, like the movie, <laughs> the movie's not like, it's the focus so much on, I don't think it's bad that it's like, that's the other thing. Like, I know that was like another hot take or against the movie for people who are like, it's too focused on Ernest. But I'm like, that's the actually idea of the movie. That's, I think, what makes it something that I hope, like, that the people who love it feel like it will transcend and be like a masterpiece for years to come is that you're put in this guy's shoes forced to like empathize or understand this character in a way it's kind of almost what the zone of interest is doing as well. And it like is not, uh, it's not normal. It's not a normal thing to do, right? Like you're, you're actually asking something of the audience to watch this three and a half hour movie with dummy Leo in the center playing this total moron and being like, oh shit, like, am I like that guy? Like, it's like, are we the baddies of the movie, basically? And so, like, I just think she's not the lead in that respect, but what are you going to do? I'm glad she ran lead. Kyle, who, yeah. uh, Kyle Buchanan had a tweet about that where it was like, the fact that she's lead, you know, people now think of her as a lead, right? Like, and then, then she will get more opportunities. Yeah, she, she position, positioned herself yeah. as a lead. And I, and I think, you know, I, I think it's, it's also wrong to criticize her decision for going lead just because she didn't win. Right. Like, what if, like, I mean, I would, I don't know her, but like, I would say like she understood the risk, you know, like the the risk, um, quote unquote, as if this is something so serious. But like, you know, that she had like heavy competition in lead, and she might not win. Like, I'm sure she was told that like, you know, you might have an easier time in supporting too but like she she bet on herself and um so she she got the nomination and uh yeah like what what if like she just she just wanted to do that for the nomination and and you know that like that in itself is also inspirational like you don't necessarily need to win for that too i think people people take like the actual or like like outsiders like i think like they think winning an oscar is like super super important to these people and some of them are just they they have like a bigger picture in mind yeah I, you know and like i also for a career too you know i i definitely am not one of these like we, there were a lot of takes this, we didn't even like a lot of takes after that emma didn't even want to win right like that kind of shit and i'm no. like emma wanted to win certainly i'm sure she did i don't think she well well win. so this is like my my other like weird narrative this season like the yeah the whole thing like she did she didn't want to win like she I, I mean, on some level, I think everyone wants to win. And, and like, if you're campaigning, you want to win. And that's why it was such bullshit for Bradley to become a punching bag right? this season. Because everyone acted like he was the only person campaigning and the only person ever in the history of the world to win an Oscar. And that it was a crime to win an Oscar. Right. Like, Diane Warren is right there. She's speaking to the manager right now. So, but it was just like this, you know, takedown of Bradley. It was just so over the top, so unnecessary. And, and yeah, like he's going through his Anne Hathaway phase right I, now, unfortunately. With like Lily, I, I like, I'm sure she wanted to win too. And it would have been great mm-hmm. if she won, but I actually don't know how different her career trajectory now would have been if she had won. You know what I mean? Like, I think the opportunity. Yeah, because you still, people now. still need to hire her for the parts right, and right like it's great to win like it's a great moment but it doesn't solve anything because like we want to see her again on screen and win more oscars and get more nominations but she needs to be hired for these parts you need to write parts for her and it would also be great for if people like studios casting directors like directors producers whatever like cast women of color in race neutral parts Mm -hmm. which i mean hopefully i'm very excited for the uh Charlie Kaufman movie that I think she's got coming up mm-hmm. that Marty's EPing. And yeah. then I'm sure I, I really was like, oh, Emma Stone will absolutely. I'm like, then within the next three months, we'll get an announcement from the trades that Emma Stone is producing a Lily Gladstone project, I feel like. Because Emma Stone is obviously way more into producing now as well. She's like really coming into her own as a producer. And uh, I just could see that coming, that their relationship will extend to a uh, producer uh, capacity. <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah, she she could be a, a producer nominee again next year at the Oscars. Sure. Can't wait. So, Kinds yeah. of kindness, right? Yeah, let's go. 
Well, that's a, a real pain too. Is oh, she sure. An on that, or, or I just... think she's a producer, and I saw the TV glow. Right, she's got that. Yeah, too. I saw. I mean, I don't know about that one, but. Which, uh, last thing here, just uh, speaking of Emma and Kieran, I was watching uh, Poor Things again, like I said, and I was talking to my buddy, and I was like, oh, this movie is great. And I was like, you know who's great, actually, who I thought was really not good the first time I saw it was Jared Carmichael, which I actually thought the second time I thought he was actually quite good. And I thought I didn't, I didn't understand why you didn't like it. I don't know. Because you said I don't that after I saw it. I was like, I thought he was fine. Yeah, yeah he like... was pretty good. And watching again. So that was wrong. I'll take an L on that. And then at, it was like, my friend was like, oh... Uh, I didn't actually think Mark Ruffalo was maybe the weakest part of all the supporting actors. And I was like, he kind of is, but he's also hilarious because he's got so many great lines. But there is a bit of like, you know, how Robert Downey's talked about like how coming out of Marvel, like it was like new acting for him, basically like reacting again and Oppenheimer. And like, I felt like that with Mark too, even though obviously he's done so many different things that it was like a little sweaty, but then I was like, who would have been great in that role? And we both were like, Kieran would have actually been really good. Can you imagine they put Kieran and Emma together in that movie? How ridiculous I mean, I just like, I mean, this is not a weird narrative this season, but a lot of people learned this season that they dated. Yeah, I know. But what if they were in the movie together? That would be so good, especially yeah. in those parts. I mean, I, I don't, I think, I, th I mean, Mark has talked about this too, like that he because he had never done a part like this before, so yeah. he was scared. Like, he thought they were going to replace him with Oscar Isaac, and then Willem brought Oscar to this. It's awesome. Great moment. Yeah. Joyce, we should wrap up, because this is long. But this was so much fun, and we'll be back next week with the Emmy. So hopefully some of you stick around for that. We'll still talk. I mean, we'll talk about all this other nonsense, I'm sure. Yeah. I mean, if, if you don't follow the Emmys, you know, you're welcome to come and learn. Yeah. It's a big They're a lot of fun. I, I like it, because um, unlike the Oscars, like, they're been a lot of changes yeah. in the past decade with the voting structure and everything and um it's not as loud as the oscars yeah. so and, there's not really like a tv twitter so that's why i prefer it and and this year uh wide open joyce a lot of these categories so wide open all my faves are gone succession is gone barry is gone better call Saul. not that I ever won anything but i have no horse in the race i guess next week we could do our first emmys picks of the year they'll they'll be so bad <laughs> It's gonna be heinous. I might mine are awful. I mean, you know mine are bad. I mean, I haven't I haven't updated them in a while, but uh, there, yeah. So look we'll look forward to that and talk to you then. All right, bye. Yeah.